good evening um, to the regular portion of the school committee's meeting for December 12, 2019. Um, the school committee is reconvening after the executive session. I'd like all of you uh, who are present to please rise in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda are recognitions. I have two recognitions tonight. Um, and both of these are coming from our uh, wonderful special town meeting uh, on Monday night. Uh, for me personally, uh, I find the town meetings um, a true form of democracy. Uh, I had my brush with democracy uh, in India as a child. My father used to work for the upper chamber of the parliament in India. Uh, there was a different kind of democracy. Uh, this is uh, so true um, to showcase the power that rests with the regular person. And so I always enjoy going to the town meeting. So my recognition tonight is really to um, the people of Hopkinton um, who came on a rainy night. Um, there was a lot of work that was done on the run up to the town meeting uh, from the school department and all my colleagues here. We stood before the town and we requested $10 million um, in the middle of the year. That is not a small amount. Um, the people of Hopkinton could very clearly see the need and they so generously and overwhelmingly <coughs> supported this ask. So my deepest respect and gratitude to them um, especially to those who do not have kids uh, who go to our schools, those who are on fixed income, on low income, we appreciate your support so, so much. My second recognition tonight, also coming from the town meeting, is for a gentleman uh, who had um, the sense of the timing sometimes, you know, we're all thinking things, but we are not able to say those things at the right time. Um, I learned through social media some good things there, right? Uh, is the, na the name of the gentleman is Henry Siegel. So I would like to commend Mr. Henry Siegel. There was a conversation going around about where are these kids coming from? Where is this growth coming from? And he got up and he said, it does not matter where the kids come from. These are all our kids, all our children. So uh, thank you, Mr. Siegel. Sometimes the obvious needs to be said. Um, it just renewed my faith. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. Um, as an immigrant, this is what made me choose America as my country. So thank you. Um, I don't know if there are any other recognitions. Anything else? All right. We'll move right into public comments. Anybody would like to make a public comment? Okay. We'll move on. Um, the next item on the agenda, reports, student council. All by yourself tonight? All by myself. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is Will Dion. Um, I'm the Vice President of Student Council, and I'm a senior um, here at HHS. Um, and sort of after Thanksgiving break, um, quite a bit has been happening here at HHS. Um, after winter break, or after Thanksgiving break, um, um, the winter sports season has started, sort of kicked off. Um, as you can probably hear, basketball is going on in the gym. Um, I know we have track tonight. Um, and a bunch of other events. Um, so that's very exciting uh, for the school. Uh, another season um, of sports. Additionally, the Student Council is having our Ugly Sweater Day um, next Friday um, to sort of kick off the holiday break. Uh, we're very excited about that. Um, additionally, um, the students um, of HGS were very excited about the new classrooms that we're getting um, that we were informed about um, after the, the um, town meeting. Um, additionally, um, as, as many of you know, uh, the high school has been working on a program called Challenge Success, 
and a lot of that took place before Thanksgiving break, um, during which the students took a survey and also engaged in discussion um, about stressors and stress levels and also redefining success. Um, and as a student, um, I personally found it um, very, um, it was a very good way to put things into perspective, especially as, um, as myself and, and fellow seniors have um, quite a few different, different things going on in our lives. So I, I thought that program um, was a very positive way to help students um, redefine success. And also, um, when we took this survey, um, which the results will be, will be coming back soon, we'll be able to sort of um, be better able to uh, identify and manage some of these stressors. Um, additionally, um, the many teachers have been um, getting the opportunity to shadow students. Um, this is also part of this initiative to um, have teachers sort of gain a new perspective into the students' um, academic and um, academic careers. Um, additionally, uh, the student council is heading to Boston next Saturday. Um, we're volunteering at an event called Christmas in the City. Um, that's sort of tradition that we, we always do in which we um, we help out in Boston at this at this project that puts on a, a Christmas celebration um, um, for many of the shelters in Boston, and that's a tradition that we uh, we always have a lot of fun at. Um, it's a good day uh, for the student council, and of course, um, the entire school is um, quite ready for for holiday break. Um, so we're sort of these these next two weeks uh, they're busy, but. Uh, we're pushing through just to, to get to that nice homework-free uh, vacation. And after the break, uh, exams will be coming up. Um, so I think we have uh, two or three weeks and then uh, midterms. And then, um, and then we'll start the second semester. And finally, um, two more events that had, have recently taken place um, were the robotics competition last Saturday and also the concerts. Um, for the jazz band and orchestra, which took place the last two nights. So quite a bit happening uh, here at HHS, um, but it keeps us busy and um, sort of keeps us busy till, till break. Any questions? Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Yeah. I should comment. On, it's, yeah. it's really nice to hear from students about the challenge success. I attended the parent night, and I thought it was one of the best presentations I had been to. It, you know, it was really impactful. There was a, sort of a someone playing the role of the student, mm -hmm. and then like about I don't know, twelve or fifteen people came up, um, emulating the course of a day. So it was you know the club advisor and the whatever coach, and the, yeah. you know throughout the day, how many asks are placed on our kids and. Mm -hmm. It all seems so innocent when you're a parent at you know 30,000 feet looking at your kid's life, but to see it kind of acted out, I was like, oh boy, that's a lot. That's a heavy load. So it's nice to hear that you as a student are also kind of rethinking things a little bit, having seen the, the presentation or the, done the um, survey. Yeah. So it's cool. It's a good program. It's great. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and giving Thank so you. many updates. So much going on for December. Yeah, we, we stay busy. <laughs> I hope you have wonderful holidays. And you all as well. Thank you. Thanks for Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. You too. So we're moving into budget presentations. I'd just like to recognize uh, that Mr. Mike Manning from the Appropriations Committee is here tonight. Hello, Mr. Manning. And if you have any questions during the presentations, you'd be welcome to come up. Um, so I'd first like to invite to Mrs. La uh, Ms. Lauren Debeau. Principal of our Marathon Elementary. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. It's that time of year again. Along with holiday <laughs> break, it's budget time. Oh, so here we are, Marathon. Well, I will present on kindergarten and first grade. The preschool um, budgeting is considered under the special education umbrella. So you'll hear me speak tonight about kindergarten and first grade. So as you know, we've done a lot of work on our enrollments. And as of December 1st, we had 566 students. Our projection for next year is more. Um, we are projected to have 588 students. So there are some adds for our budget, which the capacity study was very helpful because primarily going with our numbers before that study, 
you know, we base it on the numbers, not what we wish or what we want. Okay, this is what we're projected to have. It certainly did change the marathon budget moving forward. But something interesting that I found, so for FY21, we're planning for 588 K-1 students. My first budget presentation for FY15, we were projecting for 417 K-1 students. So in that span of the years, that's a difference of 171 K-1 students, which is tremendous. <laughs> um, so moving forward back to FY21, we are seeking when we are seeking an additional first grade class. So the projection for first grade within that 588 number is 313 students. So we are approaching 300 now. Um, we'll surely pass it by the end of this year. But with that, we currently have 13 first grade classes. We are seeking a 14th first grade class. The projection for kindergarten next year is 275 students. We are right now maintaining our 13 kindergarten classes. So what that means class size, for first grade we'd have approximately 22 in a class and for kindergarten 21 students in a class. <clears throat> so when we look at how do we support all of those little people in this building, um, I haven't had many staff requests in recent years w except for moving into the building, adding classes, but this year I do and I'll speak to what those um, are. We are asking for an additional classroom teacher for first grade. When we moved into Marathon, the plan was, and as was your plan, 18 to 20 in a class. We have not yet met that, and we would not meet that if we didn't add a first grade class. We do have a class at 24 now. Um, others have come close. We've got some 23 in first grade, and students have moved in and out. Um, but for these foundational years, Someday we would like to get to 18 to 20, but that additional first grade class helps us get to 22 in a class. There's a, with that, we need to add to our related art staff. So that's art, wellness, PE. The way our schedule is currently configured, we're able to make it work with art and music and library for an additional class. We are not, however, with our wellness staff. So you see an ask of, 0.1 FTE, and you might think, what is that? How can that be helpful? So what that is, is that equates to three classes, three 40-minute blocks. And while I'm asking for a 0.1 person, chances are, as we look at our elementary needs, we'll be able to probably share someone. Um, but it's I don't have that flexibility now with our wellness staff because we have two full-time FTEs and another full-time person that we share with Hopkins. So unless I were to borrow from Hopkins or to share with their additional class size or asks, um, Th that's how that is configured because I'm sure it sounds odd. How do you have a point one person? But that's what it means. Three classes we need at our, our building for that. And that would equate to two PE and one health class for us. We have two first grade paraprofessionals who currently support first grade. This is general education support. They cover everything. These staff members are amazing. Arrival, dismissal, they um, facilitate coverage when teachers have meetings. They facilitate instruction in classrooms. They're added support for centers, rotations, small groups. So we have two staff members who share that role among 13 classes. So when you divide up that time, in addition to lunch duty and their own lunch, it's minimal support per class. So even prior to adding seeking that ask for the 14th first grade class, I was seeking to add another paraprofessional. So instead of the person supporting five, six to seven classes, they would support four to five, um, which gives you greater time, greater face time with students. And we really work on time in class with students. Over the years, we've incorporated a system called Time for Teachers, where we have parent volunteers come in to copy, to laminate, to bind books, because we want our paraprofessionals to be spending time in class with students. So they're not doing that office work. We typically have more helpers than we do work, and sometimes we're, they're out of work because our laminator's jammed. <laughs> So we are finding other jobs. So that's sometimes one of our greatest challenges is who's jamming that laminator. Um, but we will get past that. So 
Another, I have two more um, requests on our budget. We have the addition of an uh, adjustment council of this year, a wonderful position. This adds to our clinical staff for students. It adds that wraparound service, that home connection. It is currently a 0.5 position. Grateful we never had that position before. It's like a taste of what's to come because the position is half time. Things don't end at noon because that person needs to leave. Um, and that's been a little tricky for us because we do have needs. We have um, our, our transitional program, our Cubby's Den, which is similar to the START program at the high school, similar to the Eagle's Nest um, or the Roost um, at Elmwood. And we have successfully been using this to transition children to the public school or back to school, whatever the ca case might be. And this position has been um, fabulous but as I mentioned things don't end just because someone's day ends so we seek to make that a full-time position the last request that I have is an English language arts tutor our school benefits from the expertise of a math tutor who facilitates math um, reinforcement instruction extension facilitates data analysis with teachers as we look at addressing our growing needs in our population, looking at solidifying that foundation for learning that our students have. As we look at our growth through the elementary years, we truly are in alignment. We've done um, a job sort of tightening that up over the last few years. And as our population is continually changing, working on adding tools to support that instructional approach. So it's not just the classroom teacher per se, but another added um, enhancement to solidify that foundation. And that would help us achieve that. We reworked our schedule this year, so we have a block of time that we have for intervention and extension. And something that we're finding with our staff is, OK, we've got this block of time. We've got these groups. I can't get to all these groups myself. We need more manpower. How can we address those targeted direct needs? And that position, which would be on the paraprofessional contract, would help us address that. Looking at the overall budget, of course, those asked did put me up. Um, but I, I tend not to ask just for wishes or things that I think would be nice. Truly looking at what is it that would help us maintain, carry on, and continue our growth as that's what we strive to do with our school improvement plans. And um, that's, that's what it sort of sums up to at this point. Looking at our general supplies, being very mindful of that, it might look a little different because now I had needed to add the supplies for an additional classroom. Um, something that's benefited us is Hopkins. We've borrowed some desks from them. Our building was planned for 18 to 20 in a class. So as we've had some classes increase, we're shipping some desks over, maybe a few chairs. Um, and we definitely will continue to do that as they have available things. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's an awful lot in a short amount of time. So ask away. Questions? Um, Lauren, if we were to give you two full-time teachers, and I'm just speaking hypothetically and from the land of fairies, yep. obviously, yep. because this is not going to happen. OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll bring myself if down. We were, <laughs> Giving yeah. you two full-time yeah. teachers, which it sounds like you need to get the classes down to 18 yeah. to 20, which is the optimal size for yes. kids this age. Would you even have room? So I, I've thought about that because next year we have um, we no longer have that flex space. We have specialist traveling. The health room will be a preschool room. The art room will be a first grade classroom. If yes, I know. So we had two years of that space. Hopefully, we can go back to it. Um, because it's not what we seek to do in the future. So we, every nook and cranny is used. But I thought about that because there may come a day when we need another classroom. The next room that would become a classroom wasn't meant to be a classroom, but it would be, is the family resource room. So then, should we need a classroom, if it was to be a K classroom, first grade would move to the family resource room, kindergarten would be in the art room, it has the bathroom, that's a requirement with the codes, it's got um, a little bit more in terms of surrounding neighbors, if you will. And that would be a significant loss because that's our adult learning space for staff meetings, professional development, new teacher orientation, um, 
We do a lot of our district safety meetings there. Is that um, a window? Is that the bridge the external there. building is an external room, is it? Um, it's at the top of the staircase. Right, but it doesn't itself have an external window, right? It just um, gets well, light. The, the window you can see out onto um, the, the A wing, if you will. You can, so it's right next to the library. But that, if, if need be, that's what we would use. It's got a okay. refrigerator and stove. It does. So <laughs> that's useful for those six-year-olds. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so we don't Very need that sad. now. But as you think ahead, because where would you go? Right. And how big can those classes be? <sighs> well, to be an effective classroom, we really don't want to go over the highest that we have now, 24. Little people need a lot of direction. And it's not just the academics. We're also teaching them, how do you do school? How do you be a friend? How do you wait your turn? And that isn't always reflected on growth charts and assessment information. Because having a class come together as a community means that you have the time to teach some of those skills. Children need to, how do you solve a problem? I was in a classroom the other day, and I had two different examples. I had some children who rock, paper, scissors, who went first in a game, and the others who argued and said, I'm not your friend anymore. And, you know, but we, we need to be able to set, spend the time with the one who says, I'm not going to be your friend, because chances are that's going to come up again. Right. If you're having an issue, how is, what's a productive way to solve it? And that's hard when you have a lot of little people together. I know. Regards to the space and the size, is the art room as big as the other classrooms? It's a little bit smaller due to, uh, we have two wonderful deep base sinks. There's four sinks in that room because it, you walk into that room and you're going to create wonderful things. The cabinetry is different. It's, it was designed as an art room, but we knew it was a flex space if we needed it. Just didn't think we'd need it after two years. Thank goodness we had that addition of four classrooms during the project because we're, we're filling them. And here we are already in the flex space. It's shocking to see a first grade class size projected as over three, the 313. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, that's just what we historically has been reserved for the high school. And even that, it has been lower in the 300s than that. I would it, it shudder to think about what that class size is going to be by the time they're in the high school. I, yes, I know. I just want to comment on your um, in support of your paraprofessional, oh. um, just because I think to your to your point about all the other things you teach, I think relationships are so important. And if one person is covering, you know, six or seven or eight or nine classes, the amount of time, the consistency of them getting in front of each kid is going to be very little and so the, the kids aren't going to relate as well they're not going to open up as much and so I think having the right ratio or a better ratio at least even if we don't get you right, right. even if we're better I, I definitely support that and I, and I support um, all the thought and work that you've put into this yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it it's, it seems like a constrained ask yeah. exactly yeah. I'm not asking for, for above and beyond this is sort of what we need to function and it's um, it's hard to think that we're going to have over 300 and kindergarten. sometimes that's equivalent of an elementary school um, and that's just one grade right. and when you think how much we've grown since I first presented to the school committee back when it was in the middle school library that's it's, it's a big change it, it so it's a positive a change. change everyone wants to be here but trying to keep up with it it's is being tricky. prepared to res <laughs> be responsive not having to be reactive right yeah, thank goodness we're at Marathon. That's all I, I can know. Say. Yeah. That way I don't know what you'd be doing at center. I don't oh. know. <laughs> Jen, I was just about to read your notes. Do you want to go no, ahead? Go and... ahead. You can, yeah, I, sense I, I didn't pull them up, but I, I did. I wasn't sure if I'd be back in time to catch yeah. your presentation, so I did email some comments to everyone just because I didn't want to. Uh, but I, I'm sure they've already been said in some way, shape, or form. Um, just basically that the whole idea of the fact that there'll still be 22 kids in every classroom and you know the request for the paraprofessionals I mean this is the way it goes right and so I think I don't know what's already been said but it was absolutely something that I, I felt like we have to support yeah. because that's a lot of little little kids mm -hmm. in one place yep. 
you know, with one adult. So I know you're like in a tricky intense. spot. Yeah. All very supportive. There was a suggestion of maybe two additional teachers, and then it was <laughs> promptly pulled back. <laughs> Are you sure you don't want more teachers? Yeah. Space. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. So on my end, too, I echo what my colleagues are saying. This is a time of unprecedented growth, and especially at the youngest grade level. So it's very yeah. hard. And we're very, very appreciative. I, I'm, I speak for myself, and I'm sure my colleagues would agree here. We so appreciate the work that you do, and Thank we you. appreciate um, the constraint that you bring, you know, the co you being very careful in, uh, in what you have presented here. So we appreciate it very much and 100% support your ask here. Thank, Thank you. you. We're very lucky to have you at the helm. I, the change and the difference is just amazing. And um, it's tricky. It's hard work. It's great work. We enjoy it. It is, And I'll speak for my colleagues. We, we are thrilled and so privileged to work here. But it is. It is tricky with all of these, you know, where would you put another class? There's a lot of other things that are on our minds that weigh heavily. Um, how can we support this growth with what we are striving for in this district? And um, it's great to hear that you support this. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Manning, did you have anything? Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hello, Hello Mrs. Carver. Thank you for being here oh. to present the Elmwood budgetary well, thank, request. Thank you. Uh, I know that you have my executive summary, and I love following Lauren because she so articulately outlined so many of the things that um, I agree with. So our, as of today, so this number is a little bit different from what you may see in your packet. Elmwood has 565 students. I think it's two more than what I wrote in my summary on September, uh, September December 3rd. Um, the, we have 258 students in grade two. Our second grade classrooms, we have 12. And we have approximately 21 or 22 in each of those classrooms right now. So that's a, um, that's a good number. In the third grade, we have 305 students currently. And those class sizes are a little bit bigger with 23 or 24 students in each. Um, we continue to get enrollment requests and, and uh, information, and so I think those numbers are going to grow a little. Uh, I'd like to talk about, uh, I, I did dig up a little bit of information. According to a 2014 executive summary that I was able to find from a former principal, so it was a little bit, I was here but not in this role, um, there were 469 students and 21 sections uh, at the Elmwood School that year. And we're, I'm thinking that by 2020-21, we are projected to have 680 students and therefore may need up to 29 sections um, with an additional 211 students at Elmwood. So the, in being consistent with the theme, we are busting, um, but happily so. Uh, my budget request includes two additional classroom teachers. Um, so that would give me 14 at grade two and an average of about 23 students per class and 13 teachers at grade three with an average of about 21.6 because that class is expected to be a little bit less next year. Um, I've included an additional two gen ed paraprofessionals as a request, but that's not actually a request in personnel for the coming year. It's, it's folks that we currently have on staff, but the request wasn't included in last year's budget. So you'll see it here, but to be clear, I'm not asking for any additional um, paraprofessionals for the next school year. Um, like Lauren, I need to, um, due to the additional teachers, I would need to advocate for two, um, some, a, a few FTEs. And I know that question came up. It's, it does sound odd to say I just want a part of a person to help me in wellness and art and music. Um, we'll need to add six blocks to our wellness. So that's a, an additional point two. So that person um, would become point seven. I need to add additional point oh five if I've done the math right. And I'm not a mathematician, so. I hope that I have for art and music, and that's that adds two additional teaching blocks. Um, the other request, very similar to Lauren's, is a .5 adjustment counselor. Um, 
uh, our adjustment counselor doesn't work every day. We have a point five, and and she it's it's been really incredible to add that position to our um, social emotional team. She works two and a half days, and on the days that she's not with us, we um, we we think about her and wonder what she's doing and <laughs> wish that she was with us. Uh, she really does an awful lot to meet the social emotional needs of our students and the you know the incredible issues that come up. Um, she's it's a position where she's thinking on her feet giving kids what they need in the moment and really works nicely with our guidance counselor and other social emotional teams so that would be really would really round us out and, and give us the support that we need um, in terms of expenses on my budget this year you're going to see an increase for the first time I have um, over the course of the last few years you've heard me say that I'm making paper out of wood I find in the basement, and I'm I'm out. So um, I'm going. We really looked carefully at all the things that we needed. Um, I don't want to ask for things that I think would be nice. Um, uh, something that's really happened organically at Elmwood over the years is people are using other methods to get um, instruction to kids. They're using dry erase boards and lots of tools. So paper is not as much a priority. But I, I'm finding that people are are being creative um, and we've really come to the limits of what that will allow so in each of the lines of my expense budget there's a little bit of an increase to cover the costs of additional students um, adding four additional classrooms you would think that there would be a big furniture um, request in there um, but that's not the case in the way that I've handled supplies in the past I'm handling furniture um, and so I, I thank Lauren for providing furniture when Marathon closed. We've stored some of it, and we're using some of it in creative ways. And if we need to, we'll take it off the stage where we um, do some, some little groups and put it into classrooms where it's really needed. We also probably have three or four classrooms at Elmwood currently who don't want the furniture that they were originally provided, meaning that that's being stored somewhere. Um, we have lots of classrooms at Elmwood who want to use um, less traditional seating arrangements. So if you went to a classroom tomorrow, you would see kids on whip fit balls, milk crates with fancy cushions that they've created, um, stools, mats, kids laying on the floor, kids standing at standing desks. So I think we can cover the costs of, um, we can reduce the cost there of furniture by using what we have, um, I, at least for now. I, I don't think that um, I need to ask for anything. I, I won't promise that if we get an additional, um, if we get up to the 211 more, I might be asking someday, but not today. Um, so I think that covers my requests. Does anybody have any questions? questions. Jim, I know you had comments. I did. <laughs> um, but they were they were essentially the same as, as what I you know said to Lauren. And I didn't mention the adjustment counselor to, um, to you, Lauren, but that was also a comment that I had that I think, especially because just the sheer number of kids that are coming in, even if only, you know, 5% or 2% of those kids need access to the adjustment counselor, that adjustment counselor's getting a lot of seen a lot of action. And a lot of what the counselors do, are, it's not on a grid someplace right. or, you know, they're greeting families, they're greeting children. If a child comes off the school bus today and they're not a kiddo that typically needs support, those are the folks that we can immediately say, you know, somebody needs a, a minute with somebody kind-hearted um, before they make their way to their classroom. And, and that's sometimes that's the nurse, but sometimes that's a, a counselor too, and that's nice. And the other thing I, I had emailed about, but just for the sake of you know other folks, is um, you know we're putting four modular classrooms on Elmwood, but you only have two full-time teacher requests. Right. And so the restructuring of the classrooms in the building is going to alleviate some of the pressure that you feel now. And we use right. So we we have 62 L's currently, mm -hmm. and we expect to have over 100 next year. The classroom space that the the L teachers currently use. Is shared, and, and anyone who visited Elmwood recently saw that we have a, a really colorful partition that goes down the middle of the room. And there, and the teachers that work in that classroom with the students that are there do not complain. It's not a hardship. It doesn't feel 
um, like a horrible place for learning to take place. In fact, you, it, it, lots of really neat things are happening. But with an additional 40 kids, I just don't think I can make that work. Mm -hmm. So an additional 40 children would mean another teacher. I'd need another space. It's really sometimes the teachers who are competing um, for the sound than it is the kids. And um, we have health in, a, in a, one of the modulars that we have in the back. Three health teachers share that space. Um, so this would give them a space for one more year. I don't think after next year they're going to be able to keep it. Um, but it would give us two classrooms, a, a, the, let the a, an L space, and then we would probably use the other space for a year um, as a learning center. We currently use our book room as a learning center. And again, it, 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 it looks sweet. It's not, I, I know there was some comments that they, people wouldn't want their kids in an adult space. Um, but the staff really works hard to make every space look um, right for children and feel right for children and teachers. So I would create another learning space, a learning center for special education students. And it would also be on another end of the building. So our current learning center is at the, what we call the wing end of our building. And even just travel time from one end to the other can be tricky. So it would be nice to have an, ad an additional space. Um, if I have to give it up for a classroom in the future, we'll um, come up with plan B for that. But for next year, that would give us another learning center. I just, have one, question. just quickly, thank you for hosting us when we toured. Because I think the touring that we did really helps put in context. We had we had firsthand visuals of, you know, what you're dealing with and these partitioned rooms and, and something like an English language learner, I'm guessing, is spending a lot of time practicing language, yes. which is not a quiet activity. It's you know, it's your spoken word. So the idea that there are multiple types of people trying to do this at once in one space with a shared partition, um, it seems kind of untenable to me and I think that came up so but thank you for letting us come tour because I think oh, it did welcome. definitely help yeah, um, as I looked at the budget um, yeah. for everybody that we've seen the spaces and and um, we could speak firsthand so thank you I'm, I'm personally very appreciative of the work that you're doing I mean we know the number of kids in that age group and with the conditions that we have seen you're holding it all together so it's deeply appreciated. Thank you. Um, so our many the teachers you. are, are yes, doing the hard work. Yes, to you and to all the yeah. teachers. And they don't complain when they're asked, what would you like, what would be, what would your wishes be? They're happy to share that, but they're really making it work. <laughs> <laughs> and they're happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you for being so creative with the space. And also thank you for spelling out in your budget that the current half-time adjustment counselor provides counseling and student support to some of your 59 special education students and 38 general ed students. I just wanted to read that aloud so people Thank get you. a sense of how many mm -hmm. students. That's a lot of kids. <laughs> it is a lot of kids. <laughs> For half a person. Right. Right. And so you are really doing a great job of making the most of every body and every desk in that building. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Right. Thank you so thank much. You're welcome. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks. Next on the agenda, uh, Mrs. Bellello Hopkins. Hello. Your name tag's accurate. Up until now, everyone has been Vanessa Bellello. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good evening. I apologize. I'm not feeling quite so well tonight, so I am going to keep it very brief. Um, I know you've had an opportunity to see my executive summary. Um, as Lauren mentioned, in the time that we've been administrators, the the numbers of students r rising is pretty dramatic and just in the four years that I've been sitting in the principal's chair we went from under 500 to what will be um, about 640 at Hopkins next year and um, again we had an opportunity to tour so you could see how we're using our space now um, right now we have five students that will be joining us over the next couple of weeks, which puts us at multiple classrooms of 25 um, at fourth and fifth grade. And given that we are utilizing a workshop model for math and reading and doing a lot of differentiation, that is incredibly challenging um, to have 24 and 25 students in the classrooms, along with bodies that it's getting tight to fit them, as you saw. Um, so our budget next year, we are as you know, asking for four classroom teachers. Um, just to give you a sense, that would bring our class sizes to maybe 23, if these numbers are accurate. 
um, approximately per classroom. So one less really puts us even above where we are sitting right now per classroom. Um, so we've asked for those four classroom teachers, which would bring us to 14 sections of fourth grade and 14 sections of fifth grade, um, as well as the accompanying related arts, which we need. Um, so that works out to um, 4.7 FTEs. The last 0.2 professional staff ask is to bring our adjustment counselor, who is currently four days a week, up to five days a week. Um, as my colleagues spoke to the needs that we are having, I need to tell you as a person who has been um, primarily a third through eighth grade educator, the, the needs, the concerns, the social emotional concerns we have um, for our fourth and fifth graders are significant. I can tell you that their caseloads are over 100 each, so when you're asking, um, more than 20% of the students at Hopkins utilize in a tier two or tier three basis counseling supports on a regular basis. That leaves a lot of questions. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with Mr. Bishop about challenge success and what is driving this. And there's obviously a lot of factors, but when you're talking about 20% of the students with mental health needs requiring services, 1.8 staff is just not enough. Um, and we do not have a full-time BCBA in our building, so you will frequently find me um, working in the intensive room or in one of other classrooms because we just don't have enough right now to manage with the needs. So um, we're asking for just a point two increase, but that would bring us to two full-time counselors at Hopkins. Um, I did put into mind, and I think this is really important for you all to be aware, that the recommendation for counselors is really at about 250 per person. That's what the, 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 they recommend. And currently, we're at 323 students to one counselor. This would only bring us to 310. So this, this little increase, we're still well above. And, and this is my, what I would say is my still biggest concern as a, a middle elementary principal. Um, so that brings us to our 4.9 FTEs of professional staff. My last ask is for a um, 0.2 increase in secretarial support. Uh, this would bring us back to where we were with secretaries back when we were under 500 students. And anybody who has seen the work that our office staff does, it's amazing. They are miracle workers, but this is just not sustainable um, currently. We're, uh, again, my psychologist, my counselors are pulled in to help out. I'm staffing the front desk frequently, as is the assistant principal, Ms. Babson. So we really do need to have somebody full-time um, in both of those seats in the office with 600 plus students in the building. Um, so that's the primary increase. It is a significant increase. The other piece um, of our budget is obviously our supplies. And right now within our budget, there was one piece I wanted to, to bring into light, and that would be there is a significant percentage increase because of the four classrooms. Um, I can tell you that Mr. Smith, our head custodian, and I walked the building and counted desks and chairs, and we also counted teacher desks and looked around. And so this was all based on work that we did to, um, you know, after looking at all of the inventory in the building. However, there is a chance that that would be rolled into capital, and so that significant percentage increase for um, for equipment would not be there if that goes through. So I just wanted to point that out because that was a difference between Mrs. Carver's budget and mine. Um, the other piece of our budget is really looking at curricular and supplies. And um, I think the, the piece I'd like to say about this is when my first year as principal, I, I did a little analysis looking back per student. And I can tell you that in terms of curriculum materials, supplies, everything from paper clips to um, reader's notebooks, we were spending about $130 a student my first year. This year, we're, under, we're right around $90 a student to educate your fourth and fifth graders. Um, this is what I've asked for is uh, it works out to a 20% increase, but with our increase in students, it's really not bumping that up. So for about, I'm not counting personnel, of course, but in terms of the notebooks and paper clips and everything else we need to run a classroom, um, including math, 
materials and everything else, we're, we're looking at under $100 per fourth and fifth grader in Hopkinton. So I just, I think that's important to put into perspective for our families at home, what they're getting for their money. Um, so any questions for me? I'll, uh, sure, so I'll go. So I feel like, you know, again, you know, sort of the same theme over and over again. But, I mean, the, based on some of the things that you put in your um, summary and the things you've said tonight, I mean, Hopkins is a, I, all the schools are in a tight spot. I feel like Hopkins, it's no wonder you're sick if you're being a counselor and then five minutes later going to be the secretary and then five minutes <laughs> later maybe doing something the principal does and then, you know, <laughs> like this to. is constant. And so I feel like, you know, I mean, hard to plan for this many kids coming all at once I guess but now that they're here you need all of these I mean there's no doubt I feel like it'd be hard to argue against yeah I mean we've lost positions. our we have lost both of our um, conference spaces they are now yep. classroom spaces as well so we're, we're, we're strapped you are and the fact that with four additional full-time <coughs> teachers housing housed I'm imagining in those modular classrooms and you still have 23 kids per class right. that's a that, I mean, that barely alleviates the pressure that Hopkins is feeling. So um, I think that we have to make sure that we do everything that we can, to, especially to support your oh, building you. so that the principal doesn't get sick from doing every job in the building for 10 minutes. In the well, and I'm day. not the only one. I mean, I right. have an incredible staff who's pitching in all the time, but I do worry about the toll um, when you're having 25 children and when you're talking about that 20% with mental health right. needs or social, emotional, behavioral needs on top of obviously very different learning needs. Um, it's a lot of pressure and, I, and I'm very committed to making sure that we're creating an environment where our teachers are still excited to come to school. We try and have a lot of fun. I don't know if you saw the YouTube video that we put out from Hopkins with our staff. So we're doing a lot of things to try and promote culture with teachers because I think that's really important given some of the strapped. I know that you toured some of our other spaces, you know, wondering about, you know, do you really need those four classrooms? Could you convert something? But as you saw, just like Mrs. Carver spoke to, there are five staff, five educators working in one room right now um, to provide a learning center. Right. And so just like Mrs. Carver, we've got We've got corridors up everywhere trying to make it work. And as those groups get larger and larger, it's very challenging. I was in there earlier today, and the, the amount of kids learning in the hallway is true. I mean, the, the staff does an amazing job, and I certainly wouldn't call it a complaint so much. It's just an observation. Like, these kids aren't even in classrooms anymore because right. there's just no space. So it needs to be addressed. It absolutely <laughs> needs to be addressed. And I think your point about 20% of the kids needing additional support for their mental health, that's a conversation for sure for a separate day. but. If you don't have the staff there, you, I mean, you need that person there available to help because that many more kids come in the building, you might be called in anyway for additional right. support, even with those two people. So I think there's nothing. And there are the, the tier one supports we were able to provide. Mrs. Shea used to provide counseling classes. We, we talk about it on a regular basis. That That is not she happening anymore. anymore. That's, I mean, between tier two and tier three, that is, we're in crisis mode and triage on a regular basis. Yep, yep. One thing I will say, um, you know, actually a couple of comments. I feel like some of these requests were coming, like the, the bursting of the seams at Hopkins was so obvious mm -hmm. for the past couple of years. And um, the tour that we did surely highlighted all of that. So I'm, I'm first of all very glad that we're doing the, we've gotten Absolutely. the approval with the extension and whatnot. <laughs> of course, it's only one step. We still have one more step there. Uh, but also with all of these asks, um, I absolutely support all that you're doing here. And, um, you know, again, I, I hope you are taking a break. We, we need you to, thank you. Uh, you know, stay strong and be there and hold all of this together. The other thing that, uh, you know, caught my attention is you collaborating with Mr. Bishop on challenge success. I think it's a very important conversation to be had as to what success means. And uh, there's no one. Uh, uh, formula for success. I think the more we had those conversations, the earlier we had those conversations, the easier it would be, and we won't run into these mental health challenges that we try and cope with much later. Um, so I, I applaud you for doing that, and you know, not just restricting to your building, but looking forward and working and collaborating with your colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just comment on two things. Um, 
At our capacity forum, one of the parents asked, or attendees asked, <laughs> um, with all this growth, have we seen a change in outcomes? And I think one of the things we've been talking about a lot is the way the staff has really stepped up and in a crisis mode has really tried to insulate the students from um, all the growth. So it may seem to people like all of a sudden we're getting asks, you know, this is something that's been building. We've been working at a, at a pace um, and stretched so thin, it's not sustainable. I'm so thankful that people have risen and pitched in and figured out how to make this work, but we just can't keep going forward. It's just not sustainable. It's not healthy for the staff or the students. Um, so I think we have been, done a great job of actually keeping the students' experience um, as consistent as possible, but it is only through crazy gymnastics and heroics on the part of our staff. So I really appreciate the work that they all do and um, completely support the asks from all of you. I think they're, it's just really important right now. Yeah, yeah I think Dr. Kavanaugh spoke about that at the, um, the meeting the other night when she said, we are seeing the data that this is having an impact. Um, you cannot do the same things with 25 children sitting in a classroom that you can do with 22. And I'm going to be completely honest about that, that, um, you know, when I look at my watch list data, I have a lot of concerns. Yeah. The other thing that came, there's the two things, the other thing that came to mind is that um, special town meeting, we heard a lot of support from the community and we're very thankful. But one of the things that we also heard in, in some of the comments and some of the echoed, um, I agree, or whatever from the audience, was that parents are looking for you all to ask for what you need. Because I think the community recognizes that this is a situation that needs to be supported and addressed and we need to you know, look forward. So they're asking us to actually ask for what we need. So I think if I were speaking on behalf of the voices that we heard at a special town meeting, it seemed like people understand and they want to support this. So, And I mean, as you all know that we've already come in with less than what we really did feel. I mean, behavioral supports at Hopkins, you know, those, those things, the special ed teachers. I mean, with 28 classrooms, to have um, six learning specialists. I mean, when you just kind of think about that and do the math. Um, so I think it is important for everyone to realize that all of us have definitely, and I'm certainly not alone, Mr. Bishop's going next, um, Mr. Keller, all, all of us, special education, technology, and buildings and grounds, we've all, and I know Ms. Parson too, there's other positions that we've already um, made substantial cuts on things we felt were necessary. I mean, with a school of 640 children of 9 to 11 year olds, I mean, to be completely honest, I think there should be at least three or four counseling and behavioral staff people full time. So when you ask about wants or, or you know, act real needs, that would be the next place that I would say that this district needs to look closely. I'm not, I'm not a special ed, you know, guru, but when you talk about not having tier one support, to me that's the support that is offered, it's preventative to every student. So by saying you don't have that, what you're saying is We've we're not lost able things. to do the preventative. We have right. to wait till something comes up. Right, and our and counselors have worked very closely with the classroom teachers. I know the same thing has happened at Elmwood and at Marathon. I share a psychologist with Mrs. DeBow, and I know that her counseling team and psychologists worked really closely with classroom teachers to implement and roll out things in the classrooms. And we've done the same thing, but it is not the same. And when you're talking about issues like bullying and um, a lot, you know, anxiety, dysregulation, having experts being able to work with the children and, and help them understand those needs is very important. I just want to echo what my colleagues have said, but also to thank you for your frankness about the limitations you're encountering right now, and I hope you'll come back um, and ask for what you need, if you need it sooner rather than later, because to have six learning specialists for 28 classrooms Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can see which students are really experiencing um, the loss of attention from this number of students and so few staff members to attend to them. And I know you're doing everything you can and you craft your budgets with care and you have an exceptional team here. But to me, this, is, this sounds terrifying. 
Right, and as you all know, the difference between um, one dyslexic and another dyslexic and one autistic child and another, they, they are very unique individuals and what they need is not all the same. And so just like any other group of children, you can't say what one works for one is going to work for another. Um, so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It, the independent variable here, it, we have the obviously the enrollment and growth and whatnot, but is that I know that our youth and family services department in town is seeing an increase in need, and that's what kids need now compared to what they needed 10 years ago with counseling it has changed. Absolutely. So that's appreciate you bringing it all, and, and I would echo what Meg said in being frank with the limitations. Yeah. And I hope you feel better soon. Yeah, yeah. 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 go get some sleep. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Bellella. Even superheroes <coughs> get sick. <laughs> That's my sympathy cough. Good evening, Mr. Bishop. <laughs> Good evening. You corrected that. There's one in the pile with your name on it, I think. Mr. Bishop. What kind of subject? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hi. See you. I want to first just thank you for being flexible and rescheduling the high school budget presentation. There was of a course. conflict last week, yeah. uh, so Absolutely. thank you so much. Uh, but it's really nice to get to see Mr. Bo, Ms. Bolello, and Ms. Carver present. I don't always get to get to see them. Um, if I was a, a, a parent of an elementary school uh, student, I have uh, twin second year old, uh, second grade daughters, and uh, I'd be very fortunate. Um, to have uh, my, my children under the leadership and direction of this group. They're a very talented uh, group of principals and, and great colleagues, and it's a pleasure to work with them. So nice job on your presentations. So I'm excited to talk a little bit about the high school uh, and our needs and wants for the FY21 budget cycle. Um, I feel we've put together and proposing a pretty fiscally responsible budget. Uh, with regard to our personnel increases as well as our non-payroll accounts, such as supplies, equipment, co-curriculars, and textbooks. Um, over the last two months, uh, we've had multiple meetings with our SMLs. It's another group that I think is just a tremendous asset to the district. We have wonderful department heads, both at the high school level but district-wide. I met with each one of them at least twice, sometimes three. Um, they've also had meetings with their departments just to collect data or information on what is necessary for their departments to continue to meet the needs of all of our students as our as enrollment is increasing, as you've heard, and we all know. Um, we have, based on our discussions, based on meeting with central office, we have already made some reductions. I think Ms. Bolello talked about it a little bit. Um, specifically to personnel requests, we initially were putting forward a personnel requests upwards of $265,000. Um, it has since been cut down to about $127,000. So in the difference of FTE, there is, uh, we were initially asking for about 4.5 FTE, uh, and we're now closer to about 2.4 FTE. Uh, and some of the cuts um, consisted of some things that I think would be really important to have, but uh, such as a director of social emotional learning, we keep hearing that. Uh, districts have that around us, and I think that there's some value in that position, as well as our career and vocational coach that we've talked about here at school committee a few times. But knowing where we are in the budget cycle and where we're at in the community when it comes to our enrollment and our budget. It's, it, it, I know we're focusing on things that we need, not necessarily the, the nice to have things. So those are some of the things that we, we removed from the budget if you were wondering what the differences were between our, our, our staffing. Um, and what remains is more staffing, and I'll get to it, just for our classrooms to kind of meet the needs and make sure our class sizes are appropriate. Uh, but I just wanted to comment a little bit on kind of the cuts we've already made to the overall budget. So when it comes to the personnel uh, uh, summary, we have uh, first and foremost an increase of 1.4 FTE. So that's what's still in the budget uh, and what we're presenting. That FTE will get distributed to different departments based on student interest throughout the course selection process, which happens in March and in April. Uh, but right now, some of the departments that are starting to bubble a little bit, uh, English, history, wellness, uh, our French department, and our bu uh, business technology and engineering department. Those are some of the ones that we're looking at right now as probably needing some of that staffing. Uh, for example, um, about 65% of our honors and AP history classes have over 25 students on average. Uh, ninth grade wellness classes average right now at 28.5. 50% um, of our English honors and AP classes are over 25 kids. Uh, we've had to not run as many business technology and engineering classes as we'd like to run just because we don't have the staffing to, to offer the different courses. Um, that is obviously a department that is just continues to, to, to increase in terms of enrollment and interest over the last number of years. Um, and we have certain levels of French that have an average of 29 students in the class. So those are just some areas that we are identifying that, that will, we need some support. Um, 
The next uh, increase we're looking for is um, secretarial support in our guidance department. We're looking for a 10-month guidance secretary. Right now, we have one 10-month guidance secretary for 1,240 students, seven school counselors. Uh, and, and when I started here back in 2005, 2006, I was a school counselor. We had a 12-month guidance secretary and a 10-month guidance secretary, five school counselors, and two adjustment counselors. So we have grown and we have reduced the supports, uh, and we're feeling that. We need some additional support. Right now we're using one of our campus aides who should be in different areas for supervision as kind of a, a guidance secretary at times. And so that's something we need to address, and we've seen a kind of a, just when it comes to volume of paperwork, uh, registrations, <laughs> meeting requests, those types of things, we need some more support. So that's another request that we're looking to add for the FY21 budget. And the third is um, a request that I actually came here in June and we approved, which was the 1.0 school counselor position, but it needs to be reflected in the FY21 budget. So those are our personnel increases at the high school. Uh, in terms of our expense uh, summaries, uh, what we did was on our executive summary here, I put uh, any of the accounts that have over $2,000 of an increase. We have 34 non-payroll accounts at the high school, 21 of which are either level funded or show a decrease. Uh, and of the 13 remaining accounts, only three show an increase of $2,000 or more. So overall, when it comes to our expense summary and all those non-payroll accounts, we have an increase of about $22,000. Um, the three that, that jump out when you look at the increase, the first is the co-curricular supply account. We're up about $4,000 in that. And that is just because we have more kids doing more things, which is great. Uh, we have six more robotics teams, so the registration numbers are up. We have 20 more students doing science fair, so those materials need to be ordered for those students. So that's just a little bit of the increase when it comes to that account. Uh, in our principal's professional development code, it's up $11,000, and that is basically around our decennial visit that's coming with NEASC in November. So I know I've talked to you about our, um, our collaborative conference that happened last year. So next uh, November, a year from now, uh, they'll be coming to 8 to 10 educators from around the state, or actually around New England. Um, and part of that $11,000, $12,000 is to... Um, you know, get them the rooms at the hotel, food, um, conference room within the hotel for them to do their, their work, travel expenses. So that's what's covered. Uh, and if you recall, they've put some areas of focus for us at the high school. Uh, one is around kind of a written curriculum and having it be online, which we have pretty much completed at the high school, which we're excited about. Um, it's talked a little bit about our st levels of staffing and our capacity in terms of the building space. Obviously, potentially adding these classrooms can satisfy that, as well as adding some teachers. They want us working on a vision of a graduate, which we're in the process of doing. Uh, their biggest concern was around social emotional learning. So with challenge success and looking at our schedule, those are things that we're doing when it comes to the SEL work. Um, and then community partnerships. They wanted us to kind of continue to kind of um, expand that. And with our STEAM work with Dr. Kavanaugh and Ms. Lachansky uh, and, Jen pa and Ms. Parsons when it comes to our, um, our vocational work that we're doing with Ms. Crucifuli. So we have some things going when it comes to that work. So we're excited for the visit, um, but it is an expensive visit, as you can see. But that's just part of the process. Um, and then the last is in our equipment account where we're uh, up about $3,000 just to add additional classroom furniture, student desks, chairs, teacher desks, especially if we are adding classrooms, uh, we'll need to be able to furnish those classrooms. So that's really um, kind of our increases when it comes to our non-payroll as well as personal, the personnel uh, summary. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them about the high school. Questions? So I don't have a question so much as I feel like what I'm hearing certainly in your presentation, but kind of in all the presentations, is that, um, you know, we received a budget message, and it sounds like you all have been working really hard from what you initially said you needed to meet the message, and what we're hearing as a result is that things that you actually need are not there over and over and over again. And I think that's a really important message for the community here because it is a lot of money that we need in order to operate at the level that we want to operate. But to hear that we don't have enough counselors, to hear that you wanted to add four teachers and now we're or, or having, what did you say, two and a half, one and a half? Something yeah, one and a half, yeah. And yeah. so it's, you know, to hear that message over and over again I think is important because the kids are here. Yeah. And we have projections that there's going to be more next year. And so I think it's so important that, I mean, everyone's doing everything they can to work with what they've got. But, you know, 
working with what you got doesn't necessarily mean doing the best that you are capable of doing, unless you have the things that you need to have. So I think that's an, such an important message that the community needs to hear. And you know, I wish we had more people in the audience than our principals. So, and Mr. Manning, <laughs> because I think you know, unless the message gets out there through HCAM or through folks talking about it, it, it I don't know that it's going to get out there. And to hear that everyone has had to cut people, teachers or counselors or support staff that could actually help in, in enhance the learning experience of these kids is is a frustrating thing to hear over and over and over again. So I think that's super important and I, I totally appreciate what you've done in order to meet the budget message, but I think frankly we can't meet the budget, budget message and effectively serve our students. Yeah. Well, just to be clear, we're nowhere near that budget. Okay, budget. fair enough. <laughs> nowhere near. But, but it looks like we we're trying to get to it yeah. based on the things that are happening. We're almost close to double the budget message. Okay, all right. So, even, yeah. with all even with all of the things that Even with all of the things that were on the table and came off the table, we're still hovering around 10. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that that still is a message to our community, that right. there are needs in our schools that, you know, when we hear 5.54%, the day that we heard that message, I had illustrated, I think, at the town hall that there was absolutely no way we could come in at five point. Mm -hmm. Correct, if we thought yes. about the teachers' raises when we did, right. you know, the cost of living raises, steps, and lane <coughs> changes, that was going to put us in close to four. And then if we just talked about the four teachers that um, Mrs. Bellello at that time we absolutely knew was going to need at Hopkins, we were talking almost at our entire budget message at that point in time. So yes, people have put a lot of things on the table and if we, you know, I would love to have kept all of them on the table, um, but another explicit message that we got was no new programs. So, you know, we are trying to build an educational system here and grow our programs and it, I understand it's a very difficult budget year. Um, they all are, but it, it's really hard not to be able to grow programs when you know that those are things our kids need. And I think that 201, you hear the social emotional piece, we're grateful for school adjustment counselors. <coughs> if we could have a K-12, to SEL, I mean, we, we would like all of those things, but to even get to somewhere below 10, those, those are the things that have gone out of our budget. So just to wrap up my comments, I think, do personally, I support all of the budget presentations that you've done tonight, but I kind of don't because I want you to have what you need. So I would rather have them, I mean, I don't want to say I would rather have them bigger, but I would rather have them bigger. This is what you need we in order to run right. your school. We correct. Right. I want them to be correct. Right. Exactly. So, you know, I totally appreciate what you've all done. And I, of course, support you in your work. But I feel like you don't have enough to do the work that you need to do. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> your My turn is over. I mean, the, the, I mean, yes, to all. But like the guidance secretary, I mean, this kind of thing, it really, that kind of thing really concerns me because obviously you had more we, you had to cut and I mean I just can't quite fathom how you get by um, and I know in the summer months you don't have a guidance secretary. A lot yep. of people enroll in the summer. A lot of things happen in the summer and you're using the central office um, administrator. Um, and, and our main office secretary as well. Yep. And what I'm feeling like I, I don't know what I'm guessing is that when we had to cut back on support for the guidance counselors, the guidance counselors themselves probably had to take time away from the guidance they're offering their students to do some of those administrative functions. And while it seems like it's two steps removed from a student, it really isn't because this is the kind of thing that I think we've been like limping along yep. thanks to your efforts and your staff's efforts, but right. these supportive positions are critical and they're, they are kind of student facing. They have a really direct impact on the student experience. So, um, Yes, yes to that. And the, likewise, things like the history, English, and French. I mean, these are particularly history and English I could speak to directly. You're talking really large class sizes. These are classes where students are con they're dealing with concepts that they're then writing about. Mm -hmm. Grading writing is a time-consuming thing. It's not like a multiple choice. Like, we need to offer our students opportunities to use the written word. and asking our teachers to have class sizes between 25 and 30 at the high school that requires them to then grade mm -hmm. you know, written work, it's really difficult. It's hard for them to get responses back in a timely fashion for learning for the students, and it's hard for them to assign longer mm -hmm. written work because it's more to grade. So it's just, it changes the nature of the assignments that they can humanly manage. So 
when I when I hear you say, you know, especially in the um, humanities now, where we need some support, I, I'm all for it yeah. because I think it does have a huge impact on the kinds of work that students can do, and the kinds of work the teachers have time to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, and I think so. that. It's, it's a great point. I feel like in the last few years we've added some science and math support, so I feel like we're in a good place there. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have some English teachers with caseloads of 120, 130 students, and to get feedback on a, on a consistent basis, it's really challenging for them. Yeah. Um, and to, to Ms. Belolo's point about the burnout, and people are just feeling the stress around that, and it's, it's impacting the instruction in the classroom. And you know, and your teachers again. I mean, hats off to our our staff and our educators because they, from my own kids' experience, I know that they have gotten creative with how they provide feedback. So, you know, they provide draft feedback um, with recorded voice. They don't have time to write, you know, down. But they'll go through and they'll record comments for a draft review, that can be delivered in a timely fashion without them having to write them out. They're they're creative with how they deal with the stress of, of this. Wonderful. But I think they're kind of at beyond capacity in many cases, so. Yeah. That's right, and let me just add that recording those comments <laughs> takes a lot of time too. It does, right? it, yeah. does yeah. it does. It takes me longer to do those mm -hmm. than to write out mm -hmm. the comments, mm -hmm. so I don't know if they're saving any time, and I'm very worried about morale. I mean, how long can this be sustained with all of the teachers feeling so overwhelmed by their numbers? I feel like we, we're not even talking about trimming the fat off a budget, we're, we're murdering an emaciated creature. Um, it's not even about developing new programs. Of course we can't develop new programs right now because we are barely above water. Right. When you say um, 29 kids in a classroom as a teacher, it makes me throw up a little bit. Yeah, or 120 does. for an English well, I, teacher. Right, I know. When you that's... don't learn how to write unless someone can pay attention to your sentence level prose. That's correct. And so are we going to have a bunch of kids who don't know how to write well or don't feel confident in their skills? I mean, I know you guys are fantastic. There's no doubt in my mind this is a great system, but... <sighs> Any other thoughts? Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Bishop, for coming out. Thank you for having me. a supporter of all the work that you do and all that goes on at the high school. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. So it looks like we are at the end of all of our, oh, we do have central office. I'll just go through it very quickly. Okay. Um, the superintendent's budget is about $10,000, so <laughs> the, re the rest of this that belongs to central office is actually quite a bit. Uh, so um, <coughs> the entire central office budget reflects an increase of $657,246, 366 plus of that. Um, is part of the payroll account and 291,158 is part of our expense account. So how is that broken up? Um, in terms of personnel, we have budgeted uh, salary reserve because we will be negotiating contracts with non-union staff. Uh, we have some lane changes for our teachers and that's always difficult to sort of determine because teachers will say yes I'm going to you know complete my master's degree or I'm going to be 15 credits beyond my master's mm -hmm. degree and what we find is that um, they meet those goals at about a 30 percent success rate but if I were a teacher I would certainly tell you I was going to do that because without the advance notice you know you don't get the lane change in the end. Um, and then the last part uh, in our personnel summary is just sort of our own version of those dribs and drabs, you know, as other people are asking for 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, uh, so too are we. So we have 1.1 FTEs in the central office. And for example, we have uh, a 0 0.2 benefits coordinator. That person currently works at 0 0.8, um, but we are finding that we need her there full time. Uh, we're increasing the sub coordinator by 0.1. Uh, we have a 0.5 business office personnel and a 0.3 crossing guard, but the 0.3 crossing guard was actually added in this year. So, um, let's see. And then the last thing is just our expense summary. Uh, if you take a look at that, uh, we have the big drivers listed there for you. One of them is that we have hired a company to monitor and service our AEDs. Uh, we just feel like that's the best way to be sure that they are always working, that the batteries are intact, and we have them everywhere. So um, it costs a little bit of money to do that, but if it saves lives, it's important to us. Um, our legal account has been increased, and um, 
That's because it has been coming in under budget, under what we've budgeted. The actual spending has been coming in over what we've actually budgeted. Um, and yet uh, the budget that we have is still below the average of our three prior years. Um, and then finally, just um, transportation, we've added two buses. There's been a contractual increase of $40,000, but we also have the $50,000 um, credit because we're housing the buses now in Hopkinton. So that's where all of our money is coming and going in central office. So I just want to make a comment, um, if, if mm -hmm. I can jump in, oh, um, which is that when I think when people hear central office, they're, yes. thinking, they're not understanding that this is actually stuff that has educational impact on, on teachers and changes that they have are making and also the transportation piece of what it transportation is huge in our budget it, right yes. so I just want to I know even though you did just say that just to yeah. highlight that for folks at home because I know cool. in earlier years we have had that come back to people say what why is your central office getting mm -hmm. so much more money mm. My only comment on the central office was um, just a little concern in the number of projects that we're looking at, um, building projects. Mm -hmm. it, it, so it, projects in general, but it seems we have a lot of building projects and sort of capacity management work that is completely in addition to what the normal run rate would be for the business operations side. So I just don't, I want to make sure that we have enough sort of project management coverage, and I'm assuming somehow and in, built into the FTEs that you've asked for we do but um, you know to watch transportation which is its own ginormous thing and to watch over you know an addition of classroom project or you know there are just so many things going on at once <coughs> and it all comes back to a business operation <coughs> oversight from the financial part so just making sure we have enough project management bandwidth from your office <laughs> so talk to that because that's really that's your domain. Um, but I do think that uh, at this point in time, the work that Susan and Tim Person have been doing, um, really, it's been extraordinary. And they've been getting a lot of projects done. And they've been coming in you know, on time and fairly typically like it, at or under budget. So I think we're OK. Yeah. As, as, long as, for now. as long as it's at sustainable. No, I'm not, I, I think you're right. But I, it, to me, I don't know how we're doing it. So thank you for doing that. But just to make sure that we can sustain it. Yes, I agree. Yeah, we had that conversation, Amanda. Remember when Mr. Person also came, that he asked for things, but he didn't ask for a second, Mr. Person, because it looked like there was uh, a, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of the project work. Um, I also think there is so much lead up to that right, whether it's going through the planning board or what have you, right, all those aspects that need to be taken care of. And I hope that uh, the management of all of that and the timelines around it are lined up. It's not easy when you're also managing the day-to-day -day and taking on all of these projects. So making sure at the end of the day that these classes are ready in a timely manner when we open uh, our schools in September. Yeah, no, I could that. Um, any other questions on uh, the central office budget? Just one quick comment. I, I just I think I've said this the last couple of meetings, but again, sort of the hidden costs of increasing enrollment. We need two more buses. Mm -hmm. It's one hundred forty-two thousand mm -hmm. dollars. That's a teacher, you know, and a half. Right. So I think that's a, an important thing to note too. These are just other little increases that you don't necessarily think of when you think of this many more kids. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it looks like, you know, uh, sorry if nope, anyone done, else had any comments on the central office budget line items. Um, I guess we're getting to where we're completing all of these, uh, uh, you know, items, the individual budget items. Right. Um, it's quite evident, I think, to me, I'm sure my colleagues here and the town, the growth is real. It's in our face. The numbers are all real. So as a result, what is being asked is justified coming from that growth. So if you have kids, you do need those buses to transport the kids. We can't put all those kids in the existing classroom, so we do need those classrooms and we need teachers there. So all of these asks are real and these are coming purely from the growth standpoint. This is not related to increasing the programming here. Um, our educators are doing all that they can to hold it all together. And I think they have been holding it for the past couple of years, if not more. Yeah. Uh, so it wouldn't be fair 
to not relieve them at least a little bit. This is not it. I think we will continue to see it for the next few years at least, the growth. Um, so thank you for bringing out all that uh, is needed and being keeping all the fiscal aspects also in mind and bringing some efficiencies that we have seen where possible. Uh, so that's appreciated. Yeah, and if I can piggyback on that a little bit, Mina, I do want to thank the principals and all the teachers in this district because every day when you see more and more kids in front of you, the job gets harder and harder. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is one of the conversations that we had a little earlier tonight, is that sort of the profile of some of our kids is changing. And so the behavioral needs are much different today than they were five years ago, 10 years ago. So people wonder <laughs> why are we adding staff who are school adjustment counselors, you know, guidance counselors, school psychologists, people who work sort of in that social emotional folks in that arena. But we are because it's the only way we can help dysregulated kids access a curriculum. Mm -hmm. Um, another thing I will also, you know, add is as we are going through this phase of change, um, I would also request, uh, and our parent community is fabulous, we need their cooperation. Um, absolutely. Uh, at times, you know, as we go through this change, change is not easy. Um, so we need their partners in all of this. We need their support in understanding what some of the things and stresses that our principals, teachers, uh, staff are uh, undergoing. Um, and also uh, in terms of us, just be mindful of you know, what Mrs. Bellello shared. She is in the front office a little bit and doing some other things. So just being mindful of all of them. Um, one other request I have um, is, I know this year we did not do the art and music as separate budget items because uh, my understanding is it's rolled into um, the principal uh, budgets. I was hoping if we could have some kind of a uh, pie chart perhaps of what we are asking, the breakdown of how the budget is that might help. I, I think there is time still for all of that as we try to streamline all of this as to what is the ask and how is it divided up with various aspects. Some things to think about. It's just a thought uh, of the visual of the ask and specifically showing a little bit around the growth numbers and how that's all changed. I, I really liked how you showcased that per student, what is really the increase that we're talking about. I think it would help for the community to understand what is the ask here, especially going into our conversations on January 2nd. I think it'll help. Thank you so much for doing all, all of this work. So are you suggesting that because they have so little to do between now and the time they break for the holiday, they should spend time creating a pie chart. <laughs> no, so, so let, me, let me tell you why I'm saying this. Let me be very clear why I'm saying this. Not because of that. Uh, that's the last thing I would want. But if we are to move this past, this ask, it needs to be very visually clear. Okay. Um, for It's not going to be easy. This will not be an easy conversation. But just as we were able to put the request in front of the special town meeting, it was not something that happened overnight. Yeah. There was data and information and evidence shared all throughout. And we are at this place where we, this is now a different task. This is operational budget. And the budget message, what was requested versus where we are likely to be around, requires us to showcase um, I think a very clear picture. I'm not saying it's not clear, but I'm just saying from a, we are we are so entrenched in it, we see it, but a lot of people don't. And for it to pass, I would really like to see that. Uh, and that's just me, one voice. Well, I think some of the principals might actually have that data with them right now. I can share that, as I mentioned. <coughs> Please do. Sure. Um, so just to explain our process, like Mr. Bishop 
spoke about. Um, we do meet with our CTLs at the elementary level, secondary level, it's SMLs. But um, with Colleen um, and Craig Hay, we sit down and meet with all of them. And it was actually with Colleen Janino um, was where I came up with the idea of breaking down by subject area by pers by student. And so uh, I know the other elementary principals follow the same model that I did. So when I mentioned that we are at under $100 a student, just so that you know what that breakdown looks like. Um, so for example, in art, we, over the last couple of years, we averaged about $6.45 per child. And I know that working with Colleen, that is consistent. So the amount of money we spend on art supplies per child. Per year? Per year $6 is six dollars and forty one cents this year. It's like two grands, right? <laughs> and um, in terms of art, we're at three dollars and sixty four cents per child right now at Hopkins School. So in the past, we've talked about how critical. And to be honest, we rely on places like the PT, HPTA and HEF to help support our budgets. Um, so things like um, we have a band at Hopkins and we, we needed a drum. Those are the kinds of things that we look elsewhere. As you know, even the PTA was strapped, so we don't have mid-year requests. So things like that, when, where are you going to get a drum? Um, because when you're talking $3, so what that works out to, for example, for music, um, that's $2,100 for Hopkins School. That was what we spent on music this year. That's $3.64. I needed to go to the PTA and use gift count of money over the last two years to purchase a bass drum and music stands because they break <laughs> and you need to buy more. You can't do that because that doesn't work. That, that number really covers us for sheet music just to give you a sense. So in terms of breakdowns, I know that my colleagues, it's about the same. So when you're talking about that $100, music and art are rolled into that amount as our paper clips, highlighters, pencils. So just to repeat that again, <laughs> $3.64 per student. $3.64. If would you like to know social studies too, that's $2.17. So we're spending $2.17 right now currently on students for curriculum and social studies at Hopkins. Our science, I actually, that was one of my areas that was an increase ask because right now we're at $5.20. As you know, the science standards have had a huge amount of increase in inquiry. Um, expectation in labs. So that covers all of our lab needs and as well as you know, purchasing licenses for programming, which now is what we use instead of textbooks. So yes, $5 on and 20 cents on science. I did not know you carried that around in that folder. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I the other areas, but I think that gives you a good sense. And I know yeah, my oh, colleagues yes. have, it's pretty similar at the I'm elementary sure. level. I just want to highlight you are really um, stretching your dollars very well. That is amazingly small cost for what you're, the output of what you're putting for our students. So, Well, again, we could not do that. I mean, I have an amazing HPTA, as we all do, and without that kind, we are doing this on the backs of that. As you know, we ask our parents to do a lot of supplies. Um, we ask them to help us right. extra things for engineering labs and all of that all the time already. So. Do you also get help from the HMA for music? Because I, or is that is it more middle school, high school? That has pretty much gone to middle school and high school, which is why we've gone to the HPTA, or I use my gift account money. Right. We we all, I mean, we all are hugely indebted to the to the right. support organizations that come through over and over again. Yeah, for oh, sure. absolutely, Wonderful. absolutely, and I think they have shown so much generosity in this past year. It was so much more evident to me. They, everybody understands the needs and. <coughs> Everybody's switching in. Right. I mean, as you know, I spoke about the $22,000 worth of um, guided reading curriculum that was all purchased because of saving gift account money. Mm. So just to kind of put those kinds of things in perspective, that's where that money is coming from. That's right. Thank you. Guys you guys are amazing, yeah. really. Thank really. you. Yeah. No, 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 no. no, no. Just, yeah. I was just trying to help answer because I, no, I no, thought that I, would help put it no, in. No, just, no, just to be clear, I was not, not looking for detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not what I'm looking for. No, that's not I what trust I'm looking you. for. Do I sense a little competitiveness between Elwood <laughs> right. and Hopkins? No, <laughs> no, I was talking about. So, so it's four dollars for the art budget at a, Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the one. 
one budget I think are consistent with. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because like Colleen, we spend. Oh, years. right, right. <laughs> Kindergarten. Ooh. I would expect Marathon to have more needs for that. So just so I, uh, you know, if it wasn't clear, what I am talking about is a breakdown by department, which adds up to the overall pie in the conversations that we have with our town partners. I just want that, not this level of detail, of course. If you do want to add that all we are spending is $3.64 per art as a highlight, sure. It's kind of powerful uh, when you hear it, it too, is I powerful. think. Yeah. It just makes you pause for a second and think, five bucks a year so you can teach my kids social studies. That's, okay. I'm sorry, $2 a year so I, you can teach me. That's, it's a powerful number. You can't you're buy thinking, a globe for that. Right? You can't get a cup of coffee for that. That's <laughs> insane. So I think that, I, I hear you mean it, but it is a powerful number to hear these like per child, per subject information. Can I please make a motion to allow our principals to go home and go to sleep? Yes. Okay, I know, right? <laughs> Second. Yeah, you know, let these people rest. Yeah, agreed. Thank you so much for coming yes. out tonight. Thank you all Thanks. for all the work you've done. Good night. Good night. Happy holidays. Yes, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah. Um, superintendent's report, Dr. Kavno. We are right around time, which is great. What is my rule about saying that out loud? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, so the superintendent's report is broken into three parts. Um, the budget process, town meeting update, and just the happenings in our school, which I always like to include. So I have included all of the positions that have been requested to date, and that will include tonight's as well. Uh, these first ones are all the <laughs> special education requests. Um, you can see that we have uh, an intensive teacher shared between Elmwood and Marathon, uh, an intensive preschool teacher. We have 1.8 FTEs. Um, in ABA paraprofessionals for the preschool. We are shifting um, SPED to an ABA paraprofessional at uh, Elmwood. We have a 1.0 FTE SPED paraprofessional at Hopkins, 1.0 FTE SPED ABA paraprofessional. We have a half of a psychologist at Marathon. We have 0.3 of a SPED administrative support. Uh, 1.8 FTE SPED ABA paraprofessional in the, in the preschool, 1.0 FTE SPED moderate at Elmwood and Hopkins. Uh, we have a 0.5 FTE facilities uh, administrator, administrative support, so we're increasing the secretarial support there by half. Uh, 3.0 FTEs and facility custodians. We have uh, 1.0 technology, we've got the webmaster up there. 1.0 FTE Middle School Foreign Language, 1.0 FTE Middle School Science, and 0.5 Middle School Assistant Principal. 0.5 Middle School Guidance Administrative Support, and a couple of middle school stipends, one to be the open gym supervisor at $1,000, and one to be a bus lot supervisor at $2,000. We have a 0.5 FTE Athletics Administrative Support, so, um, both Tim Person and uh, Rich Cormier will have a whole uh, secretary as opposed to sort of sharing one. Um, in athletics, we have a middle school assistant football coach stipend and a 1.0 FTE L director for curriculum. And we've talked about how our L program is just growing so rapidly that we feel like we need an administrator in that role now. Uh, we have 1.4 FTEs at the high school, which Mr. Bishop shared tonight would be spread out over various departments. 0.6 FTE in high school guidance, and that was the guidance position that was added over the summer. Um, even though it's a 1.0 position, we really only needed to, use, to add 0.6 to this budget. We have a 1.0 FTE high school guidance administrative support. Four FTEs, which will be full-time teachers at Hopkins, a 0.7 FTE at Hopkins for re teaching related arts, 0.2 at Hopkins to round out the adjustment counselor to make that person whole. We have a 0.2 at Hopkins uh, to make one of the secretaries whole. We have two FTEs to become new classroom teachers at Elmwood, 0.3 FTEs in Elmwood related arts, a half school adjustment counselor at Elmwood, and a whole teacher at Marathon. 
We have um, the ELA tutor that Mrs. DeBow talked about tonight at Marathon. We have a point one FTE, Marathon Related Arts. Uh, 1.0, Marathon Paraprofessional. Point five, Marathon Adjustment Counselor. And point five, Central Office Business Staff. The last two central office um, dribs and drabs positions that I talked about tonight is a point one uh, sub coordinator and a point two central office benefits coordinator. So those are all the positions that um, have been requested and that we are submitting at this point. Dr. Cavanaugh, is there a significance to the color? color? I was going to ask no, the same question. The, the red was, red was red. And, uh, there were a couple red. Uh, really there was yeah. a significance mm -hmm. to that. So when Mr. Keller came and did his presentation, there was not a 1.0 FTE middle school science teacher in it. Since the time that he has presented, we have added that uh, science teacher position in. And we did that uh, because our fear is that if those predictions about enrollment come true, we could have 26, 25, 26, 27 kids in middle school science classes. And that's just way too many. So um, I feel like that's an important position, too. It was one that he had originally asked for. We had taken off the table, and then we added it back in again. Okay. Um, the same thing here with a 1.0 sped moderate at Elmwood and Hopkins. Um, it's red because we originally were going to give both Elmwood and Hopkins a, a half of a special educator. And we were going to get that special educator by taking one from the middle school and then moving that person so that they were 50% of the time at Hopkins and 50% of the time at Elmwood. Um, in listening to the needs of folks, we decided that we would not steal one from the middle school and instead we would um, add that person 50% at Hopkins and Elmwood in and of itself. So it's not a transfer position, it's an additional position. Do you have a grand total? So no, you, you don't need one right now. That's a lot. That's a lot of math. Percentage so. at least. Yeah. Oh no, she has it up to date every minute of the day. She can tell you right now <laughs> what the percentage is. A little elevator music. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give you a drum roll. I don't know why I'm looking at the screen. I know. It's yeah, the screen. I'm waiting for it to show up. It's going to come from Susan. I know. Me so too. So the, the additional personnel requests is 1.8 million, which is an additional 3.8%. Um, so this brings us at this point in time to 8.9%. Okay. And you may not have it, but it might be interesting to know how many people it is like how many you, it doesn't you, you don't need 32.3 okay there we go <laughs> 32 people so in response to the number of students that we've received we need 32 people and a half Point three. so yeah. it, it, and to give Leaves. you an idea of um you know something as simple as building and grounds where originally you know tim spoke about the need for six custodians mm -hmm. and we trimmed that down to mm -hmm. three this number 32 was 56 and, and Evan wanted how you know four. So to, and, to give yeah, you an idea, exactly. that's where we started. Okay. We started at 56, and so we did work with every department. Wow. When you look at each request individually, as Dr. Kavanaugh said, they're all warranted. Mm -hmm. But when you look at that cumulative total of 56 FTEs, right. that's difficult. Right. So we did work with each department in terms of putting teachers in front of in front of students and since I've been here we have reduced supports you know administrative assistants have been cut mm -hmm. in both of these past two years to meet that budget guidance and it's not working no. you know so you see it's all been requested back yeah yeah so yeah. things like that okay now did I hear the overall number is that what you were saying when you said 8.9 percent what was that 8.9 percent is the the total percentage increase in personnel. Operation. Total operation. Total right. operation. Operational. Oh, that's everything. Okay. Everything. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I was and, waiting for the expense side, but okay, that's everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to share the town meeting results, and before I do that. Um, you know that uh, at town meeting, 
I had an unfortunate and um, really mortifying moment. And I was able to reach families through email because I have access to each family's email, but I was not able to extend an apology properly to the entire community. So before I talk about town meeting, I would just like to take a moment to do that. I'm apologetic. It was unfortunate. Um, I certainly did not mean to insult or hurt anyone. I think I was um, perhaps being flippant, um, not appropriate in my position or in that setting, and so I'm, I apologize. So thank you. Um, getting back to our uh, results, you know that we had four articles on the special town meeting warrant. Uh, article two was $500,000 for engineering design study and with um, funding from the legacy farms mitigation money that passed um, and it required a two-thirds vote so we we're very pleased at, at that um, articles three four and five are all building articles and you could hear from the principals tonight that we certainly need those um, the 4.5 million will give us six built-out classrooms at the high school and the two million dollars will give us four modular classrooms at Elmwood and the three million dollars will give us four modular classrooms at Hopkins and I can see I'm missing some zeros yes, in those millions. Yes, a couple of zeros yes. on article four yeah. and five. Yes. Oops. Anyway, uh, so I wanted to thank town meeting. That was very, it, it was really nice to see that kind of support for our schools. Yeah. Um, I believe in conversations with um, Connor Deegan, our town clerk, and um, Norman Kamalo, the town manager, and the CFO for the town, uh, Tim O'Leary, that our ballot elections to support those articles are going to be held on February 3rd, and you know that they have to go through an election process as well. And just a couple of things that are happening in our school. Uh, Mr. Keller shared with me that grade six is doing something called Yellow Team Bags for a Boost. And this is a uh, program that supports adults who are facing hardship. It gives them some kind of social support. And uh, it's a really nice gesture, I think, on the part of our sixth graders. Hmm. Uh, Hopkinson High School on December 10th had its winter con concert. Mr. Hay was good enough to share some of these photographs with me. Uh, what's new in the world of technology? I know our student council student tonight talked about some of these. So there was a VEX robotics uh, competition over the weekend. And what you see happening in the hallways there of Hopkinton High School is that those kids are building catapults. Just a couple more pictures on the left hand side. You can see the Hopkins whole school meeting, which was last Friday morning. Uh, apparently, it was come dressed as a celebrity day. Mrs. Bellello is dressed as a celebrity I do not know, but apparently, that person is a YouTube phenom. <laughs> so <laughs> the kids all knew, none of us knew. I don't think Mrs. Bellello knew even the day before who that was. But. From a distance, I thought it's the Vermeer painting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the lady with the. Eardrum. Girl with a pearl earring. Pearl earring. <laughs> That's what it looked like to me from a distance. Or a YouTuber. Yeah. <laughs> or a YouTube female. Yes, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> and then we have the Hopkinton Middle School Winter Conference mm -hmm. concert. And that's all. Thank you. Awesome. I think, uh, you know, I don't know if that's something you want me to bring up or do you want to speak to the Elmwood uh, SOI result? Oh, sure. So I could talk a little bit about that. I did include it in the capacity study presentation at, at the end of this. Um, but you know that we've been going around since probably last March having conversations about having submitted a statement of interest to the Mass School Building Authority. And we were very hopeful that based on our very rapid enrollment growth that we would be invited into the MSBA so that we could get some kind of reimbursement for a project that might be for a 2-3 school or even a 2-5 school. And for people who came to our public hearing last Thursday night, it was very exciting. We showed pictures of what that might look like. And unfortunately, in conversations with the MSBA, we've learned that there were 61 applicants this year and they have chosen 11 who appeared to be needier than Hopkinton. So we have not been invited in. And this really presents a problem for us because even though we'll submit another statement of interest this coming spring, 
what that will mean is we won't learn the results of that statement of interest again until this time next year. And typically what will happen is once you're invited in, it's a good five years from the time that you are invited in until we open the doors to a new school. So I do have some concerns about what it is that we're going to be able to do to keep our buildings sort of afloat and in place. Um, as you heard tonight, you know, Mrs. Carver was saying that, yes, I'm only going to put two regular education classrooms in those rooms, but I have special education needs, I have English learner needs that will go into those other two rooms until the following year. And then we'll be putting kids again into spaces that are not really classrooms, that are you know, storage areas with you know, teacher spaces created in them. And that is just not conducive to learning. So this has been, I think, for me anyway, a, a grave setback, really, to our plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, deeply disappointing. Mm -hmm. And I would just also, I guess, sort of a, a statement and question at the same time is my understanding is the MSBA will not consider our projections, which while we have under overcrowding right now currently in front of us, we know from the study that we've done and from looking at different things going on around town that that overcrowding is going to get significantly worse in the next six years that it would take to yes for that and so that. The MSBA is not considering that, Correct. and that's gravely concerning. Yes, I even asked them what would happen if, in those eleven schools, say for example, you know, two declined, right. they didn't want, and they shared that there is no look back. Mm -hmm. So there, there's really no hope. We just have to start the process over again next spring. Mm -hmm. I did. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, please. Sure. Yes. Uh, the the difficult thing is if for those who attended the capacity forum study forum, um, addressing Elmwood. Also, if you know, if we pursue our vision, it also addresses in a creative and responsible way, fiscally responsible way, the middle school, the high school. High, like there's sort of a, a, a really nicely presented um, cohesive vision mm -hmm. that was looking beyond just. I mean, if, if you actually look at the pinch as we toured the schools, and there's there's a pinch in all of our schools, mm -hmm. and so it really wasn't just an Elmwood. It was addressing Elmwood, but it was also like, oh, that's great because we could maybe, um, in a fiscally responsible way, look holistically, and yes. that's going to set the whole vision back. Mm -hmm. And proactively, I mean, really, that, that we want to get out of this pattern of having to react to things on an emergency basis and to be able to look and to be prepared for what's coming and yes. to embrace the fact that as a town and a district we're growing, to embrace and be ready for it. and. It's hard to do that without having the space for it. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I also felt I had a few questions. I actually want to know what the schools are, and I know we don't have it listed out on the agenda, but I would encourage us to think about if anyone has any questions to just share them with Dr. Kavanaugh, and then perhaps if you want to compile and take this back um, mm -hmm. to MSBA, uh, I think that would be a great uh, thing to do. Yeah, disappointing for mm -hmm. sure uh, yeah. that this need was not recognized. And I'm certainly curious who are these 11, which mm -hmm. are these 11 schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I also and saw, again, just taking one moment here, the different categories within MSBA um, as to which ones we have applied for. So just some clarity on, on all of that would help. MASC actually did post today the listing of all the districts that Oh, I was looking yeah. for it. I went to the MSBA site, but okay. I didn't find it. So MASC. So, but MASC has posted. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. And as we look at other districts, we have to remember that sometimes it's not enrollment growth. It's you know they have a failing infrastructure. So the building itself is so poor that you know they get a new building. Mm -hmm. I, and MSBA was very sincere with the town of Hopkinton. They did come out and tour Elmwood and they were able to see what, what the teaching and learning spaces look like. So I think that we were in a position where, you know, we had a good shot. Mm -hmm. It would seem like maybe we should bring this back for a future agenda item to right. Mm -hmm. right, absolutely. consider what, what next. Yeah. Absolutely. I think we do yeah. need to strategize, you know. I understand it's a bit of a setback at the moment, but hopefully it also gives us an opportunity to discuss very thoroughly what those options could look like, what we, uh, you know, while we have the immediate term needs figured out with the additions that we have requested and the town so generously has approved, uh, what could be done midterm mm -hmm. while the longer term seems like it's going to take longer. Are there any needs? So some strategizing as to how we approach it. Right. I think we should think about it 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for those updates. Um, moving on to the next item on the agenda, SC Chair Report. I have approved the payroll warrant, S20012. Payroll warrant has been included in your packet. I have also approved warrants numbers 20-027, 20-028, 20-029, and 20-030. All these warrants have been included in your packet. Um, and in some other updates, I had an opportunity to um, go and attend a workshop on um, it is called the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Workshop that was conducted by the planning board uh, and the town planner, Mr. John Gelsich. It was a day-long um, workshop right after town meeting. A lot of us were zombies. Uh, but uh, it was a great uh, session, lots of learning. I thought they were very bold. Mr. Tim Person joined. Um, I thought they were very bold in projecting and sharing data on how the weather patterns are changing, how uh, you know some of these things will affect us as a community, and what is it that we need to do as a town and possibly school. They were great ideas. They were a cross section of the community. I always love these workshop models with breakout groups, just as the town growth study committee did because many times when you're sitting in a big group people don't tend to talk but when you do some breakout sessions some really great ideas come out and there were some great ideas that came up you know that if there is an emergency a, a, a climate hazard and you know 135 is packed what do you do and we talked about a bunch of ideas and uh, one of the thoughts was could we have some satellite uh, parking facilities, how can we uh, alleviate the congestion on 135. So again, a, a great learning experience. I'm so glad Mr. Person was there. And my hope is that, um, you know, every time, <coughs> as they say, uh, that an adversity can be seen as an opportunity too, where I feel that the we have not been invited this year, where we were, you know, uh, maybe maybe we can start <coughs> thinking, putting all of these other aspects that we are learning about ecologically uh, safer, environmentally friendly ways of building. Maybe we are able to put that additional lens. Maybe we have got some more time to do that, perhaps. Uh, that's the only way to look at it. Otherwise, one would be very sad. Mm. Besides that, I thought the town meeting uh, you know, I, I do want to uh, take a moment and just acknowledge the fact that the lead up to the town meeting, uh, you know, people don't see that. Uh, all they see is these meetings, but behind the scenes there's so much work that goes on uh, on the administrative team side. But also, uh, I want to acknowledge my colleagues here on the school committee. We all do spread the word and, uh, you know, answer so many questions for people in the community um, and just advocate so and hear and explain. So I want to thank everyone for that. Uh, in terms of emails, let's see. Um, so there is a request from a community member um, who works at a radio station uh, who wants to record um, different school committees uh, um, saying the Pledge of Allegiance. If the committee is so inclined, perhaps we could record it tonight and share it uh, with that radio station. Sure. sure. Okay. It actually probably is already recorded. Did you turn that thing on? So I did, but, but there's actually, there is a, I believe, a script that, because it's going to be oh, played okay. on them, they're trying to get community groups to, in the radio, to, in this area to say, you know, this is the Hopkinton School, good morning or whatever, this is the Hopkinton School Committee. Okay. Um, and all, um, also, as we are going into, um, you know, the holiday season, I know I'm asking, I, I never like the timing of the budget season right around the holidays, and I really would like to push back a little bit on that date of January 2nd. Uh, to move it out a little bit. I think it's not fair to anybody, really, that timing for budget. Uh, but that's a longer-term conversation. Um, the reason I was uh, bringing that up is um, I think we have a lot that to work on in the upcoming weeks, the run-up to the budget. And all this preparation, the special town meeting just came up. Uh, it was a little unexpected, and you know there was that added extra pressure as in 
along with the budget. So one of the conversations that Dr. Kavanaugh and I were talking about is possibly a retreat and some kind of de-stressing, some team building uh, that never hurts. Uh, perhaps sometime next month, um, Dr. Kavanaugh had a, couple, uh, a suggestion. <laughs> you know, we have used MSC in the past, but mm -hmm. perhaps look at some of that as we get into January. Uh, but another thought was if everyone's available to go out next week uh, just to celebrate and take a deep breath and de-stress if that's possible. I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I'd have to look at my calendar. <laughs> no, absolutely. You were, you, were taking, you were taking a deep breath, and I know it's yeah. holiday time and everyone's busy. So uh, that's all. These nice are just to go out together at some point. To yes. Maybe for New Year's. Yes, that sounds I, good. That might be better for my schedule. Yeah, that Maybe. sounds good. Um, so we'll um, so just want to leave it at that. Uh, those are just some musings and report. Uh, on to liaison reports. So I have um, just a reminder that we have on January 25th, we have the visions training coming up. Uh, I did at Mina's request had confirmed that it worked with the Youth Commission and to kind of work around people's schedules to get that date. As we're getting closer, um, we need to kind of firm up the actual topics and agenda. I didn't know if you would like to do that with the presenter and with the chair of the Youth Commissioner, if you want me to do that. I'm happy. You're doing it. It's your thing. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, though. I think uh, as long as you're doing it, that's absolutely fine. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I have, other than the town meeting, our policy meeting group met, but that will be on the agenda later on this evening, so I have no other liaison reports. Okay. That's great. Uh, any other reports? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I'm probably looking at a different version of this. Uh, yes, I think that it was changed Tuesday afternoon. Okay. Very briefly, yeah. So okay. I think we have policy working group and then. Okay. And then the next items. All right. Yeah. Um, so the next item on the agenda under new business is the policy working group. Um, you know, I had mentioned this briefly last time when we met, is that uh, from a timing perspective, it was becoming a challenge for me, especially on Fridays. It's a little hard. And, you know, we. Uh, it's not always easy to get that all scheduled. It's only three members. It was just Dr. Kavanaugh, myself, and Jen in the working group for the policy. And I think it's such an important aspect of what we do as a school committee. That's one of the things that sets what needs to be done. Um, and I think having voices is important. And I was feeling very guilty that I could not make it um, last time. So that is the reason why I am requesting this. But before I make this request, uh, I also want to throw a suggestion out there, um, which I had also mentioned at the last meeting, is policy is such an important aspect. And I know we have a process. I would really like the working group to consider that it become a subcommittee under the school committee mm -hmm. uh, so that we give an opportunity not just for the working group, but to allow the community to participate in the process, to hear what is the thought process that goes in. In the very short time that I was on the uh, policy working group, I thought there's so much thorough work that goes on behind the scenes. We look at other districts, what's going on. Uh, you look at MSC, there are even the may and the, uh, uh, you know, shall, should, would, could, the same kind of conversations. I, I think they should become so important. And it's not at the moment very clear to the community uh, that they can't see it all or participate in all of this. And I know it's an overhead that, uh, you know, you have to do minutes, you have to post, you have to know all of this ahead of time. And after all you do, maybe no one will come to the subcommittee meetings. Uh, but that's my real desire, too. I know I'm requesting two things here, trying to get out and saying, hey, here you go, consider it. Um, so go ahead, Nancy. I think, I mean, I do think that add a layer of transparency, even if nobody comes. It right. does allow the, I don't have any objection or no that. Right. I have no objection. I think it's, I mean, like you said, it's transparency. I think the, the tricky thing, like you said, is, you know, 
it's already hard to coordinate schedules on the, during the daytime, and I feel like if we do this and post and go through that whole process, which I'm happy to do, if no one comes on a consistent basis, it's like jumping through hoops for a purpose that may or may not be, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. a, 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 there may not be a reason for it. So, I mean, <coughs> if we did this and we decided that we wanted to undo it, is there a process for that? Hmm. Does anyone know? Subcommittees get retired. I mean, I think we would have to vote on retiring it, right? I think so, right? Uh, yeah, I, I also I, I don't know what the composition of a subcommittee would be. Um, I do know, you know, just scheduling the website subcommittee is very hard to get, especially if we want community members. Mm -hmm. Many, many, if not most of them work, and you know, if it's just the three of us, but changing yeah. the administrative that, side, that's right. Yeah. Then that, um, I don't know that that'd be easier. Yeah. If we make it, if we make the composition much bigger, it's even harder. I mean, people. Oh yeah, so yeah. If, I don't know that I want the composition yeah. to be bigger. If it, the composition's not being changed, really, the only things that would be different would be posting the exactly. agenda. Exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Posting the minutes. I mean, that's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Just opening it up to public to come and be part of it if they so desire. Right. right. Be part of the mm -hmm. process, and that also allows you to invite people in if needed. And they can come in and participate if needed. Again, the whole thought for me was coming from the fact that the process uh, can, if we include more voices, more experiences, it helps. And when I was not there, I felt the burden that it's not giving that another layer, another voice in the process where there is a possibility. That's all where it's coming from. Uh, but having said that, that's not um, what I was looking for here. I'm looking to step back from this um, and I also would encourage that you know if there is anyone on, on the team here who feels underutilized <laughs> I think there's so much to do we have what 25 plus subcommittees and liaison roles if anyone is feeling underutilized you could participate in this and or anything else that we have or if you're feeling overburdened we could talk about that too and, I probably have the fewest subcommittee assignments, so I do feel like I, I I would do that or I would swap out with something else for somebody if that would be just in terms of I don't have a lot of, a lot of the things I did last year moved, mm. shifted around this year. Mm. Just by nature, I have a little bit of guilt over that. <laughs> I just, I don't want to be seen as the weak link. No, no, not at all. Not at all, Nancy. Yeah, I don't think that. I, I think we all pitch in here. We all work very hard uh, as the very unpaid volunteers, if I may highlight just for oh, a little get, bit. You know, there. ten times our salary every year. Of ten course we do. Of course we do. Uh, and, and the satisfaction that you get, certainly. So you want to step down. You mentioned that you would want to step in. I'm no pressure. I'm not saying, I, hey, do you want to do it? I enjoy the work. You would, I'd be you happy would suggest to do it. it. And yeah. not to take away from you, Nancy, because I'd love for you to come on too, but I mean, yeah, no, just, fine. you can fight over it. You can, I have yeah, it, it, paper, scissors for it. I did it, I got to do it last year, so. I mean, you did a very nice job with it. Well, I don't know about that, but I got, I, I you really. Did? You did? I, you had, I will you had say, nice I charts think, and stuff. I think the AEDs that came forward were actually an out, and out they absolutely were, yes. Result of I, yeah, I also would be willing, if there's something you want off your plate, we can discuss that at a future date. Like, I, I don't I don't have anything particular to this yeah. thing, but I also feel like, I don't want you to feel like you're getting, your list is growing more than. No, I kind of feel like you. I think my last year was a lot busier than my this year. Okay. Because, you know, the website so? stuff. Is, so we're kind of in the same okay. boat. Um, but if you want to have an, a rotation throughout, you did it a few years ago, you can come back and do it. Or happy to look to Okay. All right, you guys fight about it. I'm going to go to water. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. Up to you. If you want to do it. I'm happy to do it. Yes. Okay. All right, so are we deciding on Amanda? I think we have. Okay, that's great. Um, you know, in the past, we have done motions for the composition of the working groups and, you know, the liaisons. So I'm looking for a motion to uh, replace me with... Amanda on the policy working group. So moved. Second. So motion by Nancy, uh, second by Meg. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I as well, and so that carries. Uh, we move on to old business, designer selection board. Ms. Rothamick. Thank you. Um, so as a result of town meeting, um, 
as you know, we'll be putting out uh, several contracts. Um, so I'll be putting out a couple next week. Um, for the design engineering for the high school, we have to follow that designer selection law, uh, which means that we need to use that designer selection board. And we bypass the thresholds that allow the school committee to do it. So we have to go before the Board of Selectmen and see if they will delegate that authority to the school committee. Uh, Mr. Rothmick, I re recall doing this uh, over the summer, right, for a different reason. Yes. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, last time the process in terms of requesting to get on their agenda, do you need any support there or is that something? Uh, you you that would need to make this um, vote to ask the Board of Selectmen to delegate that authority to you. Okay. And then we need to get on a Board of Selectmen Maybe. agenda. Okay. And that part you are going to take care of? I can. Okay. And I'm happy to assist if needed. Um, but usually they've been really good in getting it on the agenda, is my understanding. Okay. Any questions on this? I move to approve the vote to request the Select Board to delegate authority to the school committee. Second. Motion by Meg, second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye as well, and so it carries. The next item on the agenda, policy GRD, publication of students' photographs and images. Second reading, Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay. Yes, you will recall we saw this uh, several weeks ago, and I think it came about because we had no policy that was covering ESY, even though we have students who are... Um, taught in our schools during the summertime. So we looked at this policy and when we brought it forth, we realized that there was some language in here that had existed for a very long time and it was a lang language that I think probably made sense when someone was actually writing this, but given the notion that the words public domain mean something else legally, it didn't really make sense anymore. And so you can see that what we've done is we have stricken all of that language in there and it has been rewritten by the school's legal counsel to indicate that uh, when a student is off-site or at a sporting event, for example, uh, which I think is what the old language public domain was referring to. So for example, if we took the ESY kids off to the YMCA camp and they were swimming in the pool and someone else took a picture of them, we have no legal authority over what happens in that, in that setting. Or even if we have a student who's playing in a Hopkinton High School basketball game on a Friday night, we really have no legal authority over that setting. So say the newspaper takes a picture of a student and puts the <coughs> student biggest life on you know the front page of the newspaper. Um, <coughs> That's not within you know our responsibility. We are responsible for the students, though, when they are in our buildings every day. And the only other thing that this says is if a student is in the ESY program and we take a photograph and we use it, we simply can't label that as part of the ESY program uh, because you can never, obviously, label that a student has particular special needs. So uh, Jen and I did read through this again last Friday morning, and we seem to be happy with the revisions as you see them on this sheet no. any I, I my recollection was that CPAC had some comments at the last meeting was there any comments because I know it went out by listserv any comments from either CPAC or anybody else we haven't heard from anyone on this particular policy when did this, this go out on listserv would you know Dr. Kavanaugh this week yeah. was it this week yeah, yeah. This week. Ago. It's, it's a couple of days ago <clears throat> I think we should give some more time to folks, perhaps, because there was so much conversation around it, um, to give them that time to read through this a little bit. Uh, Meg, uh, you know, I, not, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but as the CPAC <coughs> liaison, did you hear anything from the CPAC community on this? I heard a little whisper yesterday that, oh, yes, this is coming back. Is, have, have any changes been made? But I think people have been so preoccupied with mm -hmm. special town meeting and then the hearing we did last week that it might be an idea to give people more time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I just had one question for clarification, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to submit the form online instead of signing it and returning it, a paper form? 
I'm sure we could make that happen. I think that would make it sure. so much easier for parents. Mm -hmm. You know, especially parents like me who are utterly discombobulated most of the time. Just checking off a box online would be much better. Thank you. And uh, was there a final decision made on the opt-in versus opt-out? I couldn't quite gather that. Students mm -hmm. would opt out. Okay. In the same way that students do, you know, for the regular school year. It seems to me in reading this that the biggest change was clarifying that that ESY students and that nothing about students' disability That's right. mm -hmm. information would be included in the photographs. I think that right. maybe was part of what generated response last time was the concern that people, children would be identified as being disabled in photos, which clearly right. they're not. Yes. That's right. And the other phrase that was problematic was the term public, public domain. domain. Exactly. Right. And so that just got next completely and basically yeah. redefined for what it really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, we'll, we'll bring that back. You'd like to bring it back. So we'll bring it back on January 2nd. <coughs> I, uh, does that sound okay? January 2nd, right after the holidays? Yeah. But okay. from you all, we'll leave it as is, or do you think that it needs any, I mean, do, are you comfortable with it as is unless we hear otherwise from the community? I was comfortable I was with comfortable. it as okay. is as long as So we, we don't need yeah. to adjust, yeah. just bring it back. Yeah. I mean, it. if there is, we should be do, able to communicate so that, right? Right. Do, just right. to play the other side of this, do we want to wait until the meeting after that just because we've been so busy right now, right. it doesn't seem like an immediately pressing need and people yes. between now and January 2nd are going to make a good Absolutely. Idea. And uh, Jan the January 2nd really is not something I like for any kind of meeting. And when is ESY's, um, is it March that they sign up for it? Yeah. We have so time. we have time. Okay. Have time. All right. Okay. okay. Uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda, policy JBD, gender identity support. Second reading, Dr. Kavner. Yes, so we really didn't change any of the original language in this policy, but what we did do was we took the advice of the students who had come to hear the first reading of the policy last time. Um, they had expressed interest <coughs> in seeing information in this policy about changing facilities, locker rooms, restrooms, and so what we did was we simply added uh, the language that is on the DESI website that, you know, sort of complies with um, the regulations in Massachusetts. It's really it's verbatim. It is pulled great. from, yeah. yeah. Super. It's great. Good policy. It looks great. Um, I think uh, the, the students who came out supported it fully. It's really nice. Uh, was there any further uh, circling back with them on this, did you say? So, interestingly, when the uh, this was sent out uh, via listserv earlier, Lisa Winner, who is uh, a teacher here at the high school, um, did let me know that she might have some students who would come here tonight just to sort of see this policy through. Uh, but she did also say that it's a top time of the year for them sure. to be. So I spoke with her today about it. It did not seem that anyone had any problems with it, the way that it was written right now. But if you wanted to put this off to the ninth as well, we could certainly do that, or we could vote for it tonight. I'd be comfortable putting this through tonight. I think this reflects exactly what we heard from the population that is closest mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. So yes. it would be nice to put it into play. Sure. And if they do, if there is anyone who's uncomfortable with any of it, I mean, it can always be changed later on, but That's we don't right. have this policy. Right. So yes. to put it into play as soon as is possible, yeah. as, as long as there aren't strong objections from anyone in the community or here, I think it would be a good idea. It's a gap. Yeah. 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 And the words that... Yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah. And the words that they're going to come here to see it pass through gives me, gives us that feeling that's supportive, right? Right behind how it's worded. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I hope that's what everyone would have thought. You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But we, we haven't heard from them, so I, I think that they'll probably be like almost to a one comfortable with it. So, I mean, it is what they asked for and it's what the law dictates. So, okay. okay. I'm looking for a motion um, to. Move this policy as presented in the second reading. So moved. Second. second. Oh. Um, so motion by Nancy, second by Meg. All those in favor? Yes. Yes. I'm a yes as well. And so it carries. And um, you know, I, I realize I think in error we removed. We were having that item called future agenda items. I think that got uh, missed out. 
uh, in error. Um, but in terms of future agenda items, are there any ideas, thoughts? I've seen some, some conversation in social media about um, how uh, how legacy farms' monies have been. Um, it's a large reversed. conversation today. A bit of a large conversation. So I was just wondering if we could have a report um, come back to school committee about. It, it's confusing to from everybody. The it would be from the town, you mean? Uh, well, if we could eat, actually, both would be nice. Um, a joint report would be wonderful. But at least for starters, where were the enrollment points that would trigger I have some of that an action? Me. Okay, and then um, it'd be nice to see it as a slide so that people could really digest it. And then, so what monies are owed to us? I think that that's there's some conversation out there about that and what have we received, which <coughs> so far. That's great. Any other thoughts, ideas? Yeah, that's a great idea. The future agenda. Okay, and I have one request, you know, to just put that back in. I think it got missed out in error. Um, so your request is to add future agenda items, items on the agenda. <laughs> just to clarify. Yes, yes. Sure, the future yes. Agenda. yes. Um, time for public comments. Oh, did you want me to do the capacity study? Oh, I'm so sorry. That's I'm. Okay. I, I guess I'm looking at two different agenda items. Like. Look, I, I don't I look see it on here. either one, though. It's really right? Like, I don't see it on this I one. I have two different I open. have it online. You do? Yeah, yeah. I do. do, um, do well, you I did a minute ago. Oh, here it is. Right. It's right. It was till I clicked the wrong thing. Um, it's, I think it's because of the revision. Right here. I have it. D. You do? Under the, Sorry. Okay. Oh, it is there. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I see it. It's, it it's really close it's to the bottom. It is. It's like right above public comment. Sorry. It didn't have that. Okay. Um, moving on to all right I'll just zip through this very quickly because I'm wondering if you know we did this so quickly last week that I wonder if there are questions that you know people continue to have at home um, I did include the questions that came on the note cards because if people asked okay. about them they should be getting responses to them uh, some of them were just comments so I didn't quite put them in there uh, so I, I know that people are thinking, so now you've got that capacity study, what are you going to do with it? And, you know, we've gotten the bad news from MSBA. And so I think that, you know, we're in a place now where we have to consider what has been predicted about enrollment, and we have to plan accordingly for that. And, you know, unfortunately, we don't have that MSBA immediate reimbursement. Um, and, and I think we have to look at that. Like, what is it going to look like? We've just put $10 million into 14 classrooms. That's an awful lot of money. Um, I think that uh, we're lucky to have a little bit of time to determine whether or not those enrollment numbers are going to actually play out. You know, Arthur Wagman was at last week's uh, the uh, what is it? Can you think of public, public, public hearing. hearing? Public hearing. That's yes. what I'm thinking. Yep. And you know, he said it's really you know he calls it catching smoke. But at some point, you know, you have a year and then another year and then another year to see how many of these things uh, the the predictions are actually coming to be. Um, I think that we need to look at our study and think about what parts of that study are people in this community actually interested in pursuing. You know, so yeah. if we think you, know, that you could have an amazing two to five school, is that something the community is interested in? Um, moving everybody who is six to 12 onto this side of Hayden Rose Street, does that actually make sense for our community? Uh, we have to take a look at all of our physical plants and how those relate to academic programming. And then I think in the, I would say in the next year, we have to really think about what a comprehensive 10-year plan is going to look like for the Hopkinton Public Schools. Uh, so just taking a little bit, a look again at enrollment information, we give you number after number after number. Uh, from July 1st to December 1st, our net gain is 166. <coughs> If we look at the October Sims report in 2015 to the October Sims report in 2019, it's 399 students. Uh, we have the actual enrollment over time, and so if you start up there, and I've shown this slide many times, with kindergarten starting at 198, by the time those kids are in 10th grade, they are a number of 291 students. And I'm showing this again because I had so many people ask me questions about that algorithm and about you know how does the life of a cohort actually exist. So you can see the growth in a cohort from 198 to 291. 
Um, as you go across and you see grade two at 253, you can see that they grew to 299. And at some point, my guess is that grade two cohort was probably significantly smaller in kindergarten because as you're looking at those kindergarten numbers, you don't really see anything that looks like 253. And we know that the year marathon opened. We expected to have about 204 students. And you can see on that slide that we had 260. So 60 kids more than we anticipated. So we do have that cohort model. It gets bigger, uh, rarely gets smaller. It gets bigger faster, too. It gets bigger faster, too, mm -hmm. now. Absolutely. This is 10 yeah. years, or this summer, six years, there's 100 more kids. That's crazy. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you can see our projected enrollment numbers. And so people have asked me, what about the algorithm? Is that going to actually sustain? How did you get to these numbers? What's your confidence levels? And I think that my confidence levels in these are high. But again, there's no way for us to know that this will actually become the growth of the Hopkinton Public Schools. Mm -hmm. What we can say is that when we used to do the growth predictions in Hopkinton, we used only those first two bullets. You know, and even at town meetings, someone was asking these questions, how do you know, how do you know, how do you know? Uh, the first two bullets are things that we always use. We use the birth date rate data, and we use the cohort sur survival methodology. So the 198 became 291. In this particular study, we also had new housing developments taken into consideration. And that was not just you know new housing developments, but what kind of construction is it? Is it a um, condo complex? Is it single family homes? Is it single family homes with four bedrooms? What does that look like? And how frequently are those things being built, right? Are we going to build out 100 homes this year, 10 homes this year? <clears throat> the person who conducted this study for us also looked at resales and talks about in-out migration. Um, if you take a look at my little stick figure at the bottom, what you see in those yellow call-out boxes are the actual questions that people asked at our public hearing last <coughs> week. So do the projections account for aging homeowners who will sell their homes to younger families? And I will say that the answer to that is yes. You know, he sort of looked at that median age of a person in Hopkinton. At this point in time, it's declining. The average age here is getting, uh, and the median age is getting younger. Um, so that might be an indicator that folks are selling their homes and younger families are moving in. Um, was the same algorithm used that as when we were voting on legacy farms? I don't know what algorithm was used then, but we do have an algorithm now, but it's enhanced with additional data. And the last piece of additional data is just the open land. Right? There is still land in this community that would be likely to be developed for housing. So that's what contributes to it. I was curious, so did, did um, Dr. Wagman give us the algorithm so that we can plug in new numbers? Oh, on our no, own? I can ask him for that. I mean, if he's if there's a formula yeah. and there are variables, and the variables don't actually prove to be the same as what he entered, it'd right. be nice to work with that over time. Mm -hmm. it, it typically, uh, you know, I, I remember asking that question you know, mm -hmm. here at the school committee meeting and also the public hearing. When we talk about the confidence level, those are the analytical models that carry that built within them. Mm -hmm. So when you put in that data, they will tell you, is it a 95% confidence interval, or is it a 97 or a 99? So it's usually 95 and up, uh, that kind of a conf uh, confidence interval. Now. I would imagine that all of this would be proprietary for them in terms of you know the input that they put in and what the mm -hmm. input is what they're gathering from here. But the output when it comes out, uh, as I had said at that meeting, my hope is that after putting all this money that we put in and all the effort in requesting all of our town partners to provide this data, it is not fair that at least in the near future, next year, the accuracy is way off. If it is within a 5% range, it's one thing. But to be off by 100%, 150% is not fair. Mm -hmm. I would like my money back. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you that. So other things that he considers as he's doing the work is when you take a look at the birth rate data, you know, we were 
always hovering in that 118 to 133 range until 2016, where you get to 159, 2017, 176, 2018, 147, and 2019 is 149, and he's extrapolated that number out to get to that. Um, we have the 2017 master plan. Hopkinton has developed new rentals, condo, condo complexes, single family homes, so all of that has been considered. Um, he takes into consideration that back in 2007, 2008, only two, 27 building permits were issued <coughs> each one of those years. And in 2016, 385 building permits were issued. Uh, the realtors who are selling people homes in this community are telling us that um, somewhere around 80% of their clients are saying that they moved to Hopkinton for the schools and the overall population of Hopkinton has gone from 14,925 in 2010 to 17,974 in 2018. All of that kind of stuff has been put into this study. And there's much more. I just sort of picked out the salient ones. And I know that I've shown this slide as well before, but the guesstimate for next year is a net gain of about 234 students. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, I, uh, you know, when we met at the last school committee meeting, the chart that we saw where the net gain numbers we felt were a little different than what we had been, I had been thinking. I just want to understand that when the projections are made, are they the net gain or are they the gross? And what all does that number include? I think that we've been looking at the ins and not taking out the outs. But when we take out the outs, we get to, we're at about 167 since June right now. July 1st to December 1st. I also think the number, that, the other number we've been talking about that was 250 something, if you, if you look at what the enrollment was at, on September 1st of 2018, versus right. what it is now, it, it gets you to that number that we have been discussing. Yes, that is true. And I think another thing that um, we have to take into account is when we look at a school year's growth, we have to remember that if you think about that school year starting on July 1, it's going to go all the way to June 30th, right? So it just keeps creeping up. And one of the things that you see is, you know, a lot of house closings happen at the end of month. So by the time we get to January 31st, mm -hmm. we'll have like a good little chunk that, that comes in then as well. So the 234 is what we're expecting on September 1, correct? Not what we're expecting on June 30th. No, I the think in the, the year, period between <laughs> July 1, 2020, yeah. and June 30th, 2021. Okay. In one okay. year's time, you would expect to enroll 234 kids. But that's not including what we're going to get between now and July 1. Correct. Right. That, that was the estimate of the 104, correct? Yes. From last year, which was that all extra algorithmic work that was done by Nestec. Yes. Uh, and so my understanding was that the 104 was the estimate through the end of the year and that we were already at 270. But what I'm hearing is that as of now, it's 160. I, ju I just would like that clarity. I don't want to throw numbers and right. you know, throw things off. Just want to be clear, because there are also the out of districts and the vocational. So mm -hmm. there, are, there are two aspects to consider when we are talking about space, the physical space. We need to think about kids here in the buildings. Mm -hmm. And then you have the overall budget picture that would have to include the out of districts, keep tech and all those other yes. uh, aspects. So I just want that clarity uh, right. for my sake and for everyone's sake. Yeah. And when we think about the Norfolk Aggie, um, Keefe Tech, out of district kids, I don't even know that they get to 100. You know, that's a very, very low number. OK. Yeah. All right, so uh, <sighs> the yellows are the questions that folks asked. Um, the first one I've already answered, what's your confidence level in the projected growth? I'm thinking it's pretty good, actually. Uh, will building permits be limited until the school expansion takes place? And I just say that one is a town question. It's not a school question. Uh, can we expect to see new programs that the schools will offer? And I think that we are always trying to grow our programs. And so even though, you know, tonight we talked about no new programs, but we really do have CVTE, we have STEAM, so we do have those programs, but we've been funding those with grants, to be truthful. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, will there be an expansion to Marathon? I didn't see that in the capacity study. And you know from hearing Mrs. Debo tonight that at some point, yes, there's going to have to be. Right? We're already emptying out health rooms and art rooms to put students in there. Uh, what is your vision on making technology more available in the classrooms? And one of the things that I will say is it's really easy to add technology when you're in the midst of a building project because you can do all of that infrastructure work and a lot of times those devices can be part of the new school purchase, right? Uh, what were the enrollment projections for the last couple of years and what were the actuals? And so Georgette and I tried to pull out some of those uh, old NESDEC paperwork today and I'll tell you even looking at the NESDEC paperwork is a little bit confusing hmm. yeah, because there, there's different numbers in different places but you can see that regardless of what was projected we have been um, in 18, 19, 19, 20 and then in 2021 we're going to be I think much further along really than, than where we thought we would have been. Uh, what did we learn about our facilities with that capacity study? So I wanted to revisit this because I don't want people to be confused. When you look at that diagram, and it will tell you that if you have purple, blue, or green, you're going to be in a really good place in terms of the size of the space. So if you're looking at Hopkinton High School here, you can see that things like the auditorium, the cafeteria, uh, this library, too small. Right, for, for where uh, the number of kids in, in a school of this size. But when people see all the green and yellow, I'm sure they get confused and think, oh my gosh, what, I mean, uh, sorry, when they see all the, the blues and purples, they think that's great. And when you see all the green classrooms, you probably think, I can't imagine why there's a problem. Well, the problem isn't that the classroom size itself is too small. The problem is that there are not enough of those classrooms. So I just want to keep clarifying that for people at home. Well, okay, I just have to say something, because yeah. I went to the concerts for the high school, and I looked at that blue stage, and I said, yeah, I this. <laughs> so I took a picture, which I'm happy to share, of yeah. the band trying to fit on the stage, which is deemed but the audience. significantly over, I can't read that, but significantly, I'm not sure why it's significant, because it's 10%, but whatever, significantly oversized. The student musicians barely fit. Literally, I was worried about Mr. Hay tumbling backwards off the stage. He had about two feet. I mean, they were literally, one was, I like the flag on our head, like at the side, and the other, they were barely fitting. And this is the concert band. So I worry about, I don't know what exactly led to that being blue. I'm not sure how that thought process went, but it is the reality for Hopkinton is that is absolutely not blue. And not all the classes can fit in the auditorium. Is that correct? Oh correct. my goodness, there are two classes in this building right you now that could not and actually and we know fit as a whole at class. The projections, in there. pretty soon none of them will be able to fit in there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Which and I think, you know, when we look at that stage, we have a huge number of musicians, an inordinate number of musicians. Which is really awesome. It's an awesome problem to have, but you're right, that shouldn't be blue given our situation. Right. So yeah. That's why I, I don't know. You know, I wouldn't want the community to see, look at the blue. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a kid in high school, you might not realize, or if you don't have a kid at Elmwood or whatever, you might not realize what the blue, if, how the blue plays out in our population. And the ability of the parents to sit in there. Oh, yeah. To watch it. their kids perform <laughs> on stage. And, you know, and honestly, the, things like the auditorium, the, co the concerts are so wonderful. I would love the seniors to come and other community members. I mean, they're... It's great music and mm -hmm. very uplifting to see how people spend their time. So there, there's a community impact of some of these um, group spaces as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I just take some of the color coding with a little bit of a grain of salt mm -hmm. as we Good look point. at how we and Hopkinton use the space. Well, if you think the blue on that stage is bad, do you see the band room, the red at the bottom? Yes. You which, should go in there at some point oh, when Mr. There. Hay is actually rehearsing with a group of kids. It's packed in there. So that says to me that perhaps we have a higher number than other districts of kids participating in musical programs. Is that? Oh, I would say that's very true here. Yes. Well, but again, nice. we serve as a MICA host site. Yes. Yeah, we yeah. have for a long time, and that was something mm -hmm. that was built up by Mr. Guevara, and it's, it's, we're very proud mm -hmm. of that. So we're inviting bands from all around the state to come compete here. And we may have a large number, but I'm sure we're not the only district that has a lot of musicians. I, I would like to 
continue. I'm very proud of that we are, we are a mega site. I'd like to continue to be that. Mm. So again, I, I think this is a third party view, and I think you know it's interesting for us to maybe look more closely <coughs> at the schools we're we're close to right now and kind of get our own assessment of what mm. we think. Yes, I mean that's what MSBA would tell you was appropriate square yeah. footage for this purpose in a high school with that many kids. Right. Mm -hmm. But it is an interesting point because mm. they're not looking at us. Mm. They're looking right. at a generalization across however many thousands of yes. square footage studies. So if someone took the time to actually look at us, they would see what you're talking about. Our, our yeah. sort of our values, our, what we value in town, right. our priorities. Right. Yeah. You know, and that's where, you know, we speak to the fact that that's what if you were to do a building project, that's what the MSBA would do reimbursement for. However, as a community, you would say, but we need that plus X. Right. And that just becomes non-reimbursable. Yeah. So it's, it's not that it can't be done. It's just two sides to the formula. Right. Using it. MSBA. Yeah. Yep. Mm. That's a good point. Uh, okay, so here's the Marathon School. Uh, you can see that in, this is probably a, a very good depiction of what MSBA would do. So the green are our classrooms at Marathon, and that tells you that those are just the right size for pre-K, K, and one classrooms, right? Because that's what they'll fund, our classrooms the size of the ones that we have in the Marathon School. What it also shows you is that right now our cafeteria is too small already <laughs> in Marathon. It's terrible, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Um, and I've just included these last couple things because I want to point out to the community that what you saw on those slides were really <laughs> options. You know, so um, the Teachers Association said, you know, can we talk about this? And I said, of course we can talk about this because, you know, when we even think about some of the things that might be happening on this side of Haven Row, or at least the way it was painted up there, that could be seven, eight, nine, ten years out. You know, mm -hmm. what we're really trying to do is, is develop some kind of plan that has um, some structure to it. Uh, this was the drawing that they had done for us of what it would look like if we put a great big two, three bar core for five schools so that you can sort of consolidate your services there. And again, options. And, oops, oh yes, and here's where I tell the part that we were not invited into the MSBA for reimbursement. That's out of the bag. <laughs> yeah, it is now. Oh. Um, and then the last little bit of options is just uh, that really nice uh, addition that they've they've shown to Hopkins School, uh, where you have science and black box theaters and regular classrooms and additional uh, administration space and a bigger kitchen and a bigger cafeteria. Um, so a lot can be done with that building. Again, options. Mm -hmm. All right, and then the last question, and I know this is all. There it is. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, the hot button item, what is happening with the legacy farms money? So I did put this slide together so that people could see. Um, and that might be hard to read, but I'll kind of walk you through it. So that very first invoice for legacy farms, it came in October of 2018. In October of 2018, our Sims report said we had 325 students. So when we hit 250, we were going to get $500,000. So once we built the developer <laughs> for the $500,000, that dollar amount was paid to the town of Hopkinton. And you'll remember we put it into a stabilization fund, and now we just took it out so that we could do the engineer design study for this building. So that first 250 all set. For whatever reason, and I don't know the answer to this, 266 is where we start the counting. So for every increment of 30 over 266, uh, there is supposed to be an incremental, an incremental billing point. So when we got to March of 2019, our SIMS report said 
342 students. And then when we got to October of 2019, our SIMS report said 441 students. So starting at 266 and adding increments of 30, you can see that we can go all the way out to 416 and add five different increments of 30. And if we take that 441 and we subtract the 416, as of our October SIMS report, we were already 25 more students <clears throat> toward an, another increment of 30, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So when we were in October, the second invoice was sent to the developer, and that invoice was in the amount of $831,300. And then in November, a third invoice was sent, and that was for $1,246,950. So there is currently an outstanding balance of $2,078,250. And that's based on 441 students that were reported in our October 2019 SIMS. Mm -hmm. So that's not an increment, that's an addition. Right, so the 831, we didn't just send an invoice out for the $1.2 million because it went up, you know, approximately $400,000. It's adding those two numbers together. Well, what, so what I think happened was in March of 2019 when we hit 342, if we did 266, you would have gone to 296 and then 326. So you would have two increments which was billed, I think, in two th October of 2019. And then when we got to... One month later? No, when we got to the October, right, but you are right about the billing schedule. When we got to the October 2019 SIMS report, we had gone to 266 to 296 to 326. So then we would have also gone to 356, 386, 416. And that's when we sent out another three increments. So 831.3 would have been two increments, and 1,246,950 would have been three Additional increments. Three. And if the numbers don't <coughs> quite match in terms of a ratio, it's because the amount that is associated with each increment of 30 grows a teeny weeny little bit more exponentially each time. Mm -hmm. So now, do, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Matt. Matt. I just, um, I vaguely remember language just in the agreement that um, payments are due at the end of the fiscal year. Or is it counts by the end of the fiscal year? There was some, the there was some thing about the end of the fiscal year as a key time marker. What was that? It, it's the, the student count at the end of the fiscal year. Okay. But the problem is we haven't been paid yet. Correct. Yes. I, so that the, the March would have been eight, last fiscal year. The then. 831 is late. Is that That's correct? That's right. And you, they've been billed for the million point two, but and we also haven't received that, but the... 831 was actually due at the end of the fiscal year. 831 was due July 1. That Do you have any sense from the town of, of when we could expect that? Just I know last year we got it in the middle of January. Is that right? It from was the 2018. It was received in the fall. However, there was discussion on how okay. to to get it into the school. Okay, correct. Gotcha. So. Uh, you said that the 831 was due on July 1st? Yes. Um, so when we say the second invoice was sent in October, that means was that a reminder sent in October? I actually have copies of those invoices. I can look in, in a moment. But it seems to me Separate that what invoices. that is saying is that the invoice was actually sent in October. Okay. So, so we just sent it? <coughs> is that how I'm understanding it in October? It went out late. Is that... It I'm went in that might be true. So, um, we don't send the invoice. Yeah, well, it, it goes, it goes through hall. the town. Yeah. So we report to the town. I see. And the, the, so the so, control over the actual billing is not in, in our hands. I see. So the invoice was sent two months ago and a month ago for the third invoice. Is that right? I haven't seen the invoice. Okay. And I think, again, you know, tying this back to our agenda item on the capacity study a little mm -hmm. bit here. Um, so... Uh, is it that we are looking to see how this could be utilized for the overall bigger project plan related to the growth, just trying to tie it back um, to the capacity study conversation a little bit? I do think that we need to talk 
uh, with our town partners and share the fact that, I mean, it's all very clear the need. In the ask, we are certainly going to have those conversations on January 2nd. <coughs> yes. Um, but also that there is this outstanding amount that we should be looking to secure. It was billed on October 9th, 2019. October 9th? Yeah, 2000. That's when the 831 went okay. out. Okay. Okay, so slightly over two months ago. Mm -hmm. And the November one also. I think 1115. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So about a month ago. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I think there's a process that gets delayed or what have you. But that's a huge chunk of money. It uh, is. That is in balance. And our need is right here. Mm -hmm. We are asking for all of this. And I recall us saying that whatever <coughs> monies we are able to secure in uh, through the stabilization fund, we kept it open enough that we could utilize it uh, as needed during the year for um, not just capital items, but some of the other growth-related needs like teachers. Um, so that's another source of funding for us um, to consider. Also, the town could be collecting interest on that money. Well, also, I think we need to receive it. In order to have it allocated, we need to yes. receive it in advance of town meeting in May. Right. Yes. Yes, Otherwise, absolutely. we have to wait to leave another special town meeting or another town meeting. Otherwise, but it doesn't get into our fund. The town would also be accruing interest on it if it was in the town's account. Absolutely. Which, I mean, even if it weren't, e even if ours. it wasn't in our hand, yeah. the town would be getting some money for yeah. it. Yeah. And I mean, that's a big. Okay. That's like a hundred thousand dollars worth of I'm interest. I'm going to guess right if I owed that kind of money to the town. <laughs> Dr. Kavanaugh, if you don't mind going back up a little bit on the um, slides. Uh, where you had the drawings a little bit. Yes. Uh, a little bit before this, the options. Yes. Um, so I have received a couple of comments that I would like to share. Mm -hmm. One is the fact that, um, you know, building another school on Hayden Row without having another passage or another way of entry was a concern that I have heard mm -hmm. uh, uh, from some of the folks who are living off of Hayden Row. Um, so I would hope that if we were to look <coughs> at that option in the future, and I know there's a lot of work to get to that point even, that we look at many alternate ways of getting to that site. And we know how difficult that road can be with all the congestion that we have seen. And I think there will have to be a lot of collaboration between the building that needs to be done and the work that needs to be done on the roads, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one consideration. Another um, uh, email uh, that I received uh, was from a community member who said uh, she's very supportive of the immediate needs, that it's absolutely needed. It's very clear from a growth standpoint. However, from the longer term, she uh, shared some concerns that, you know, is all that build out necessary? So just sharing it, uh, the commentary that I have heard, uh, I would think that in the upcoming uh, months, we strategize a little bit as to how we can involve. I would, you know, it was great when uh, in the public hearing, I saw a young man get up and speak and share his views. Uh, I appreciated all the teachers who came up and talked about, you know, their very real concerns. Uh, I also heard people who talked about building up, zoning. I think there are so many stakeholders in this process, uh, including school committee members, that I would uh, hope that as we continue to work on this uh, important work, we bring all the necessary stakeholders and strategize what are the other methods um, and what are the options we could look at, uh, and how could we do it in a sustainable fashion both from an environment, ecological aspect, but also from a financial aspect, um, long term. Uh, my friends at the Senior Center uh, were not happy today when I visited them. They were very supportive, many of them, you know, they're so generous and they support mm -hmm. our schools, but um, they were very unhappy with the fact that, uh, you know, they're feeling the pain of the tax increases and they are saying, your driving is away. It's very hard to sustain uh, this. So I just want us to keep that in perspective. I'm not saying it's this or that. I don't think that's what it is. We just uh, keep that 
fiscal responsibility in mind and when we are building it's the entire community and I'm so appreciative of the support they've given so far I hope you shared with them the debt service piece because that will impact any building that project that we do that oh absolutely Mr. absolutely Catino was talking and mr Hurst absolutely as well, and mr o'leary about how absolutely that will mitigate the um mm. some of the pain, the pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you know i will share my faux pas uh, i shared it with dr kavanaugh there was a gentleman who you know the conversation around it's a lot for the community right yeah. now with all the change and the transition mm -hmm. this was around the downtown corridor project mm -hmm. Uh, and I said, uh, but we are only paying only three million dollars, and uh, he did not appreciate that. He said, "You are not on. I don't think you are on fixed income." Um, and so I'm just saying mm -hmm. that we have a cross section in the community, and absolutely, the debt schedule is what helped us make these helps us make these kinds of decisions. The things are falling we'll off us. of we'll that, help us. right? Yeah. Um, and um, I know I said that in my statement to the independent as well, that that really helped us uh, convince a lot of our senior voters and a lot of other voters that it's coming down, uh, that the growth and need is real. Mm -hmm. um, so again, bringing it back to the next steps here, I'd like us to strategize a little bit as to what this looks like. I was really excited with the idea of the one, two, three, four the way you had explained it, that the possibility of some commonalities there, um, some shared services. I thought that was a good I mm -hmm. I idea. Um, that was something that excited me quite a bit. Um, but I am not fully uh, aware of some of the things that people talked about in terms of social, emotional, with the eight and 12 getting, being in the same space. Those were some things that I would like to understand better. Uh, is a question a follow up on what you're saying that, that's okay I would think it, um, once we get to the feasibility piece there would be options that would be explored and, and the opportunity for the community to come in and discuss and mm -hmm. weigh in much like we had focus groups when the marathon school before it became the marathon mm -hmm. school they looked at different ideas of how to do it where to do it and whatnot and brought the community along mm -hmm. as part of that that would be my hope that yeah. we would mirror that process and I think with the where, we're very lucky um, in that you know, a lot of the open parcels were really analyzed nicely with Marathon. So like we have a lot of data that's sort of right. leftover data. So the nice part is you wanted to pay for it twice. Right. A lot of, lot of work ahead on this. Uh, a lot of work ahead. <laughs> I, I, th I think a little bit of a breather, hopefully post-January, but there's so much work uh, mm -hmm. just with the portables and the high school extension. I'm actually very excited about the high school mm -hmm. extension. I'm just looking forward to that coming to fruition too. I was here today and I think, you know, just jibber jabbered with a couple of teachers who were also very excited about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, uh, just to round it off, I think the pain is real for some of the folks who are on fixed income or low income. At the same time, I also heard the comments, the kids are here, mm -hmm. we need to support it. So just saying uh, what we are going through as a community. But uh, again, ending the meeting tonight with the very fact that we did get the 10 million approved with an overwhelming majority. So that's a huge plus for us. Um, and it shows the commitment of the community in education um, and the fact that how much we value education, kids, teachers, and the entire team. So on that note, uh, since this is the last meeting of the end of this year, I'd like to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas. Uh, happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, uh, any holiday that you celebrate. Happy holidays and a very happy new year. Same to you. Thank you. And uh, just, yes, we, we, we didn't, we don't have any public, so I'm assuming no public comments there. Um, and items by consensus. Dr. Okay. Cavanaugh. The superintendent, I recommend the school committee approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. So Motion. moved. 
Motion by Second. Chair. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. Uh, I'm a yes as well. Looking for a motion for adjournment now. So moved. Motion by Jen. Second. Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. yes. I'm a yes as well. Our next meeting will be on January 2nd, right here at the high school library. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob.